Let's get this party started. Mr. President, pro tem, you can sit anywhere you'd like. You, there's, there's seats right out here on the front row if you like that. I'm sure you John. can. John. You're live. Okay. Will somebody pull that door to a little bit when they get, tell them to come on in? Gerald, will you shut the door? Well, welcome. I know all of you are as happy and as excited as I am about being in this capital during the month of December. Uh, sort of thought that, you know, hey, we're here. There's one committee that's very busy, but maybe there's some stuff we could go ahead and maybe get a head start on. Um, I, as I learned with uh, much enthusiasm, last late last spring communication is of utmost importance and i don't want us to not be communicating about the budget again so that's why we're here we figured we'd just get a little head start so we start with our constitutional officers and let us tell them exactly what they have asked for in the budgets um, and before we get started I would like to ask, where is he, Chairman Perkle, if you would like to open us in prayer. Bow your hearts with me, if you will. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you in the quietness of the hour, Lord, I thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Lord, I thank you for those that will be presenting today for the servant leaders that we have. I thank you for those that will be listening today. Lord, I thank you for bringing us here. And I pray for great wisdom as we want to be great stewards of the resources that you've given us. And help us as we lead this state forward. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chairman Purple. I guess with that, we'll call this joint session of the House and Senate Appropriations Committees to order. And I will ask my colleague in the Senate, Chairman Tiller, if he'd, he'd like to make any comments. Okay, well, I'd do that with much reserve. So. Well, thank you, Chairman Hatch. I just want to tell you first, thank you for inviting us to attend these hearings today. Uh, You're so welcome. Uh, but I appreciate the members and their presence here. You know, we've got uh, unprecedented times on budget, uh, the, mainly because of the decisions that many of you in this room have made that were difficult uh, over the past five years. So we're in a slightly different position. Look forward to working with the governor's staff and OPB on how we can make sure that we're making decisions that make the most sense for Georgians, not only today and tomorrow, but for generations to come. I know you're uh, keenly focused on that for each individual corner of the state that we represent individually and then as a collective for what we do for the whole. So thank you for your presence here today. We hope that some of the things you hear allow you a little bit of time to go home over your holiday period to uh, digest them figuratively and literally with your communities. Maybe have some other ideas on how we could tweak things and make them better. And make sure that, it, again, the budget that we're preparing, which will be for the FY25, I cannot believe that, uh, fiscal year 2025, um, is a budget that we all can be proud of, a budget that reflects the values of the state, and a budget that doesn't put us in a position that if we should face conditions like we faced in FY09 and FY10, that we're not uh, pinned, that we have allowed these good times to put us in a position uh, to be able to weather storms when they do come 
in a way that doesn't cause us to have to drastically reduce services or drastically reduce jobs to families that we know are going to be relying upon those services and jobs. So thank you for being here today. Thank you, Chairman Tillery. So first up is a joint presentation between the Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, and Superior Court. Y'all have a little plan you got some ideas about, so here's your opportunity to hopefully not be rushed in a presentation. And you have 45 minutes, but you don't have to take it all. <laughs> We're scheduled to be here till quarter to six. We'd love to get out of here before then, but justice is for yours. I, I think it's appropriate that you say that because during oral arguments, uh, we often tell lawyers that while you have 20 minutes, sometimes shorter arguments are more effective. Um, and so we, we and appreciate I, And you. I don't even have training as a lawyer or a judge. So. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman Hatchett, uh, Ch Chairman Tillery, members of the commission uh, or committee, uh, joint committees uh, for inviting us here today. I'm Mike Boggs. I'm Chief Justice of your Supreme Court. Uh, I have here today with me uh, your presiding justice, Nels Peterson, uh, and also Justice Charlie Bethel. Um, in addition to those uh, here from the Supreme Court of Georgia, I'd like to recognize Chief Judge Amanda Mercier of the Court of Appeals, uh, Vice Chief Trent Brown, uh, who is likewise here. We also have President of the Council of Superior Court Judges, John Morse, uh, and his leadership team, and of course many Chief Judges, Superior Court Judges, from across your 50 judicial circuits in this state. Uh, we understand uh, that by inviting us here today, uh, you're not looking for our typical presentation going line by line through our amended or fiscal year 25 budget, but instead have specifically asked us to focus on the Judicial Council's judicial compensation proposal that uh, will make up uh, the most significant portion of the budgets that your committee will see from the Superior Court judges, the Court of Appeals, and the Supreme Court. Uh, in order to make that presentation, I'm going to turn, this, turn the podium now over to Justices Nels Peterson and uh, Justice Charlie Bethel to make the presentation. Uh, at the conclusion of the presentation, uh, we welcome your questions uh, about the compensation proposal or about anything else that is in our respective classes of court budget. So with that, uh, Presiding Justice Peterson. Well, thank you very much for having us. Um, and we appreciate your openness to, to listening at some length to something that is a long standing challenge of this state that has developed over many, many decades and has resulted in a compensation system by which Georgia's state judges are paid that is exceptionally complex. Um, and so I will get right into where we are and what some of the challenges are with the current way that Georgia compensates its state judges. And let me just start by defining that term, because we have many classes of court in Georgia, but there are only four classes that are state judges rather than county or city judges. Your Supreme Court, your Court of Appeals, the newest class of court, the statewide business court, um, and then of course your superior courts. Although Superior Court judges are compensated in part by counties, they are state officials. Um, everyone else, all the other classes of court are the county or city judges. So, where are we today? Today, the state salary for Superior Court judges is the 49th out of 50 highest salary paid for the top level state trial courts in the country. Only West Virginia pays less. Because we allow counties to supplement their salaries, the total compensation of Georgia's Superior Courts range from 45th in the country to 5th in the country. A wide, wide range yielding considerably disparate impacts both on who is able to serve and how long they are able to serve. Turning to the, to the statewide judges, um, your appellate courts really lag their state comp uh, comparators uh, from other states, um, you know, 
30, 32nd, 34th um, in the country. Um, and just to look at how that has evolved over time, 20 years ago, 2003, and this is not cherry picking a particularly high year. In 2003, your state appellate judges were paid $153,000 and it had been flat for several years over, before that. Um, if you took that number forward to 2023, we presently make $90,000 less than that. And so the real purchasing power that your state appellate judges earn over the last two decades has fallen by almost six figures. The experiences of the judges of the Superior Court are similar, although because of the wide range in what they earn, it varies from locality to locality. This has been a problem that has been recognized for a long time. Local supplements began in 1904, and at the time they were authorized only to be paid in Atlanta, Augusta, and Savannah. Well, over time that evolved, and, and now uh, they are paid by every circuit, although in widely varying amounts. Um, and over time, this body has, has taken several efforts to, to fix it. So in 1971, there was a Blue Ribbon Commission to study compensation of all constitutional officers that recommended in 1971 increasing appellate judge salaries and increasing Superior Court judge state salaries while still permitting local supplements but capping the amount of local supplements at just under what the appellate judges were making. Like most Blue Ribbon Commissions, nothing passed. Um, and the problem has, has continued over time. The most recent study commission was in 2016, where this body passed um, a, a study committee to study this precise issue and also included district attorneys uh, and public defenders, which is an issue we will not get into today because that is beyond the scope of the Judicial Council, but because of the way district attorneys are often paid, it is a, a related item. Um, so in 2016, this report was created. Uh, it recommended change, um, increasing appellate judge salaries uh, to about the eighth in the country, um, basing that amount on what federal district court judges were paid, and then giving superior court judges the choice of continuing their current compensation approach or going to a fully state-funded uh, salary um, that at the time would have been set at, at 175, um, but also recommended providing by law for regular cost of living adjustments to keep salary stagnation from limiting the range of options uh, for our, our judges. Um, again, um, none of those recommendations uh, were adopted, uh, and so we are here today. So what has happened since 2016? And in 2016, this report made clear that, that there was a very serious problem. Well, since 2016, it has only become more acute. And 2016 doesn't feel like that long ago, but that may be because I'm getting old. Um, since then, federal district court salaries had been at $203,000 and have, have gone up by $20,000 20, $20, as of last year. Um, but the market for legal talent in the private sector has gone up by considerably more than that. The first year associate starting salary at large Atlanta law firms, which was 155,000 in 2016, is at $215,000 today, um, a $60,000 increase that actually outstrips the rate of inflation substantially. This, Appellate judge salaries has, have gone up about $10,000 since 2016. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics calculator, that is a reduction in purchasing power of almost $42,000 during that time. Superior Court, the top end Superior, superior Court compensation has increased um, by about $15,000 during that time, which reflects a reduction in purchasing power of almost $47,000. And of course, the numbers are even starker for our lowest paid Superior Court judges. 
Um, and again, the broad and wide disparity among our Superior Court judges really exacerbates this. What are the negative consequences of this current structure? Well, one is the heavy reliance on county supplements often acts as a structural obstacle to increasing state salary. Because if you're trying to increase state salary to take care of the folks at the lower end, you also wind up increasing the salary of folks at the highest end. And you know, while we want to pay our judges equitably, we don't want to pay our judges the most in the country. Um, and so that wide county supplement disparity winds up having an overall depressive effect on what we're, what we're going to pay our state judges. This wide range in compensation, honestly, just candidly, creates some divisions among judges in ways that are unhealthy to the, the proper functioning of the judicial system. Um, there's also, particularly with respect to uh, the local supplements that are paid by county governments that, again, are not the employers of Superior Court judges, there is a serious tension inherent in a system in which state officials have to rely for a substantial portion of their compensation on entities that are not their employers and that have material financial interests regularly impacted by a wide range of decisions those judges make. Again, that's not to question anyone's ethics, it's just to observe there is a tension inherent in that structure. Also, and this is where the rubber really meets the road, decreasing real compensation over time to the extent that that compensation has been reduced discourages qualified candidates for offering themselves for service, whether through appointment or election. And as we're seeing all over state government, retention has become a serious problem. Um, I can list anecdote after anecdote of trial judges who have left the bench um, because they simply can't afford to serve anymore. Um, and in my court, the Supreme Court, has just in the last three years seen three of our justices um, in a position where they needed to leave to, to be able to afford college for, for their kids. Um, so that is, that is where we are today. Oh, yes. Thank you. So, 2022, Chief Justice Namius appointed, is there anything you'd like to add to the, where we are? Chief Justice Namius created the Judicial Council Ad Hoc Committee on Compensation, co-chaired by Justice Charlie Bethel and Chief Judge Rusty Smith from the Mountain Circuit. That's Habersham, Rabin, and Stevens Counties. It included representatives from all the various groups you see there, um, but not just judges. It was also prosecutors and other relevant stakeholders, including local governments. Um, and the charge was twofold, to, to revisit and update the 2016 study that this body had, had called for, and then also to make a concrete recommendation, but to make that recommendation only if it could garner the support of a supermajority of Superior Court judges. After over a year of hard work, the committee developed the proposal we're here to talk to you about, and 86% of all active Superior Court judges voted to endorse it, as well as the Court of Appeals and Supreme Court. Let me just say that anything you can get 86% of judges to agree on um, must be pretty good. So what is, what is the proposal? There are several elements to it, and the first one is this idea of a base rate salary structure. It is the salary that you're starting from, and it is based on the federal district court salary at the beginning of the previous year's fiscal year. So we're not trying to, you know, stay shoulder to shoulder with federal judges, but using that as an anchor to, to follow along. And you see there the, the um, so different percentages, uh, Supreme Court would be at 100% of that amount, Court Appeals 95%, Statewide Business Court 92%, and Superior Court judges 90%. So that's the starting point, percentage of federal district court salary. Federal district court salaries increase each year by a preset formula that considers cost of living. But, of course, no General Assembly can bind a future General Assembly, and so you can't bake in an automatic escalator. 
What this would do instead is say that that amount of federal district court judge salary that adjusts each year, that becomes the maximum authorized salary that this body then retains 100% discretion as to how much of that to budget. The, the bottom end would be whatever the previous year's salary is because the Constitution prohibits reducing a judge's salary during term in office, and the upper end of what could be funded through the appropriations bill rather than changing statute would be whatever that previous fiscal year's federal district court judge salary was. So you have this maximum authorized salary that adjusts each year but does not commit you to anything that you don't want to do. Anything you would add to that element of that? It would also, and this is important, replace the existing county supplement system where counties can pay any amount that they want with a much smaller cabined locality pay that still allows for the reflection of differences in cost of living but is capped at 10 percent of the total state salary that the legislature has authorized through the Appropriations Act in determining how much of that maximum authorized salary to fund. Counties would have the option to pay that. It would not be mandatory. They simply would have the option. Next slide, please. There would also be opt-in and grandfathering for sitting judges. Again, given that you cannot reduce a judge's salary during term, this gives judges, and some of the judges on the high end, this plan as, it, as we present it to you, would represent a, a very small reduction the first year. Um, it gives them the option to, to stick with what they've got for now um, and to opt in later on. Um, but it also, and this is important, and this gets back to, to in part the, the DA issue and many other things, there are a number of, and DA of course is a state official, but there's a lot of local officials who localities have decided to peg their salary amounts to the compensation of Superior Court judges. And what we don't want to do by fixing the Superior Court compensation problem is impose by surprise an unfunded mandate on all of the counties across Georgia as to all of those other officials whose salaries have been tied. And so our proposal would freeze those linkages, those automatic linkages, not not freeze counties' abilities to adjust salary, but freeze the automatic effect of that linkage for one year to permit this body the, the time to consider do we want to continue those linkages or not, and also to provide the local government's time to consider do we want to continue those linkages or not. Um, and then finally, it would provide for a permanent judicial compensation commission that could make periodic recommendations to this body for other things to consider, whether for state judges or for all the various classes of court. Um, and then finally, the, the key features, again, I've specified the, the specific elements, but we believe that this would address um, that, that long-standing range in, in payment of state judges that have resulted in considerably different treatment and that different treatment can have a disparate impact in who is able to serve. Um, it, it aligns the accountability and, and the compensation for state judges with their employer, the state. Um, it accounts for differences in cost of living and every level of affected court has enthusiastically endorsed this. The Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, the statewide business court, and again, 86% of all active Superior Court judges and over 90% of those responding. Um, that is the, the nuts and bolts of the proposal. Um, this gives you just a visual of the top line is where we rank presently and the below is where we would rank were this implemented. And again, this is not a proposal that takes us to the highest paid judges in the, in the country. We have too much respect for the, the obligation to safeguard our taxpayers' funds to ask for that. 
Uh, we believe this is a reasonable request, but it is complicated. It is significant. Um, and we really appreciate your time and attention uh, today and are happy to answer whatever questions uh, y'all may have on this point. So you finally had a question, but I do have one clarification, I guess, is so the Superior Court new salary, according to what I'm looking at here, would be 201060. That's correct. And the local the local addition could be another twenty thousand one hundred and six dollars. That's correct. Up to that amount. Who's number twenty seven? Hey. Judge. Of the judge, local <laughs> judge. You know, I got to say something. <laughs> um, Justice Peterson, uh, isn't it true that, that part of the uh, tension in the Superior Court ranks is because basically the case weights and everything are equal to all of the just judges? They're basically doing the same job just in locations that don't pay and some locations that do. Is that a correct assessment? Certainly the, the jurisdiction of all Superior Court judges is precisely the same jurisdiction. The case weights that are applied to every case are the same. Um, all of that is counted equivalently. Okay. Yes, and Mr. Chairman. One of the complaints that I've heard from the legislature is the speed at which we're handling cases in the judicial branch. Could you I've heard those that? same complaints. Okay. Can you address that, please? Uh, we certainly have very serious concern for the responsibility to move cases quickly. Um, I know every judge in this room shares that concern. I will say for the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals, the Constitution actually obligates us to decide every case we have within two terms of court. Uh, and so far as we know, neither court has ever missed that deadline. Um, and superior courts, and, and other trial courts within this state, and really today we're just speaking to the issue of superior courts. Um, we have a lot of really, really hard working superior court judges. Um, we have 225. Anytime you have a group that large, you know, there are outliers in both directions. Um, but you also have leadership of the Judicial Council and leadership of all of the councils that are committed to taking all of the necessary steps to ensure that cases move in effective and efficient ways. Mr. Chairman, if I can continue a response to that. So I agree with everything the presiding justice said, um, Mr. Chairman, but I would, I would respond in addition this way. Um, the governor a couple of years ago allocated $96 million to the judicial branch uh, to be administered through OPB and the uh, Judicial Council to remediate the backlogs, to provide services, if you will, resources to judges across the state and communities across the state to remediate backlogs of serious violent felony cases. Um, I've been chair of that committee since its inception, and I can tell you that while anecdotal, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, but while anecdotal, these data that, tell, that, that the circuits are providing to me in support for their application for funding tells me that they have significant backlogs, but what we're seeing is that those backlogs of serious violent felony cases are now, are now diminishing. Um, you all should know this is a serious problem, and it's a serious problem across disciplines in the state. We have significant workforce development problems in the judicial branch. We have circuits in this state that cannot hire district attorneys. Uh, you know, if you don't have all of the players in the courtroom, from a court reporter to an interpreter to a victim's advocate uh, to a judge um, to a prosecutor in a criminal case and a public defender in a criminal case, any one of those critical components missing means you're not going to be able to move that case. Um, and so we have worked very diligently to provide those ARPA funds to circuits to help them hire prosecutors and public defenders likewise got money. It's not allocated the same way, but they got money to hire prosecutors and public defenders and so what we're realizing across the state is that with 50 circuits and 159 counties and 225 judicial uh, uh, judges on the Superior Court bench, there are desperate, disparate resources across the state, both on physical limitations on where you can hold court, on IT limitations on whether you can hold some court remotely or otherwise. Uh, we were very fortunate to convince OPB just last year to allow us to use some of these funds to allow your courts in your communities 
to build IT uh, services in their courtrooms. So our judges are now able to do first appearances in criminal cases remotely, hold maybe divorce hearings remotely, um, and provide a lot of services to your constituents and to the people in this state that deserve justice um, so, so that it not be denied. And so while it is true that there are still some lags uh, in trying to get some cases through courts, I'm proud of what our courts have done. You all are responsible for a lot of that because you've helped help support our, our efforts to, to use these funds to remediate resource problems. But we continue to have problems across the state. I hear from Superior Court judges and DAs constantly where, for example, anecdotally, a fully staffed district attorney's office would have 17, 16 assistant DAs and one DA. And there's a particular circuit in this state that instead of having 17, has three assistant DAs and a DA. And that is, that's going to have collateral consequences. And so I, I think that question deserved that more lengthy response, but I'm, I'm sorry for having to give that. But thank you for your support. Secretary Meeks. Mr. Chief Justice, to follow up on that, uh, one thing before I get at that, first of all, thank you to, thanks to you and the court for holding some oral arguments down in Pierce County okay. uh, back in October. I've heard tremendous uh, compliments from uh, from that visit down from both parents and students okay. in the Pierce County uh, school system. Uh, to follow up on what you were talking about in terms of workforce development, can you talk about staff, staff attorneys, pay it as, it, as it compares to uh, other government attorney positions and the turnover rate that you may have? Yeah, I, I can give you some, some specifics about our turnover. You know, we have a central staff group of attorneys that reviews, jurisdictionally reviews everything that comes before your Supreme Court before it even gets to me. Um, and we have had significant turnover in trying to fill unfilled central staff positions. I will tell you, uh, surprisingly, that many of my colleagues on my court, so eight other justices who have tried to hire, uh, internally hire lawyers to work as full-time career staff attorneys, we're not getting a lot of applications. Um, it's not been easy for us to hire people, and it's because, one example, anecdotal, is that I would have a term clerk that would come work for me for a year and then leave and go back out into the market and I've got term clerks that have left me with one year out of law school. Now, they've worked for me for a year, and I'm confident they're, they're, they're much better when they leave me than when they came, uh, but they're making more money than I am the minute they leave. And so the market, this New York pay model that a lot of the firms in Atlanta have adopted to attract uh, really the highest and best talent um, has siphoned off a lot of the people that we want, that the Court of Appeals needs at their court, um, and, and it has consequences. We really need the best and the brightest at our courts in this state. Um, and like DAs and like public defenders, we're having challenges recruiting those people. Do you have some specific? One thing I'll add to that, I know, I know the House Budget Office had asked for specific uh, turnover rate numbers, uh, both from us and the Court of Appeals, which we provided that Budget Office. Our number over the last three years was 57% turnover. Thank you, Senator Kirkpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question has to do with the juvenile courts, and I know that's a little off the track, but I've learned quite a bit about the juvenile courts in my new role as chairman of children and families, and they're on a different model the way I understand it, with their salary being local, but their benefits and retirement being statewide, uh, which is a bit confusing, and I wondered if you all were looking at that in conjunction with all of the other um, things that you're studying. We have evaluated that as part of collecting the data set that we were updating from the legislature's 2016 report, Senator. Um, what I will note, um, it sort of gets, I think, thrown around casually. Juvenile courts are now in their th third or fourth decade of being a pilot project. They are funded by a grant that you issue, uh, and all of, I think, their basic statutory framework that continues to exist as a pilot project. They were, they were originally created as a support mechanism for Superior Court, where that jurisdiction originally resided. Um, there are plenty of places where I, where I, I think formalization would benefit um, in that metric. Because their funding is through the grant and then local supplement, they are not part of what we have proposed here. I, I, but the legislature is, I think, more than empowered to explore how we compensate uh, and manage um, the juvenile court process. 
if, if I can, Mr. Chairman, too, on, on Chairman Gunner's comment, um, most of you all know, or many of you know, I, I grew up in the manufacturing world and, and in the carpet world, and I know a lot of you all have signed the front of paychecks, too. I will just observe that a, a compensation model ought to incorporate all of the managerial tools that you have at your disposal. And if you build the compensation piece, the salary piece, toward your lowest expected performance, everyone will give you the lowest expected performance. That is to say, if the, if the answer of why we can't pay what we think is right in the market is some people are underperforming, you will find that over time, everyone will underperform. So that, that's, there are other tools I think that we probably ought to focus on in that respect. Yes, Chief. Uh, Senator Kilpatrick, I've read your recent report, and I, I really appreciate the work of that committee. Um, and I note in a related recommendation of your committee um, how it is um, tangentially related to a question of case backlogs in this nature. Um, your first recommendation, page 15, if I recall correctly, is that we have a lot of siloed case count and caseload information across this state that is not being shared. And, and so I'll tell you to the extent people ask about case backlogs um, or you ask about clearance rates or you ask about how hard are judges working and what is the metric or the performance model that you would look at to determine that, um, that is very, very difficult to answer. And it's not because we don't want to answer it. It's because we have these data disaggregated in 159 clerk's offices with different management information systems. And it's not unlike my conversations about behavioral health um, as an analogy. If you ask your 159 sheriffs in Georgia, how many people do you have in your county jail that have a serious mental illness? The answer is, I don't know. They all measure it differently. Some don't measure it at all. Some screen for it and some don't. And so to your point, your recommendation resonated with me um, the importance of, of remediating a disaggregated um, and oftentimes missing um, and, and, and insufficient data system of cases among our judicial branches, or our judicial branch, but all classes of court, including juvenile courts, is very important. To the point about retention, um, I mentioned losing individuals to the private sector. The last thing I would say, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, knowing you want me to hurry up, is that we lose a lot of people um, to other government entities yeah, and particularly yeah. local governments who can yeah, pay more. Say so part of our retention is a challenge there too. I know the Court of Appeals has experienced that um, and when you're losing employees. So thank you for that. Thank you. Chairman Perkle, you're, you got the next question, but before you ask your question, I just want to let the, anybody from the Court of Appeals or Superior Courts on the wall, if y'all would like to say something after we get this question answered, please move forward. Chairman Perkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for your presentation um, to my friends. Um, so I was not surprised to see 86 percent approval. Uh, there's nothing like rallying the troops uh, with an increase in, in pay plan, um, but it is fairly complicated. So it is, as I understand, it's at least a three-tiered system that would include um, a base pay that is based somehow, I'm assuming, a percentage based on a uh, U.S. District Court judge. Yes. And, and I'm not sure how closely we will link that. Uh, and, and then we have um, the inflation-adjusted portion, and I'm unsure if we have other state employees that have inflation-adjusted compensation plans. Uh, and, um, and and then not including the you know the ten percent for the local maximum local, um, so that's not including the grandfathering and the opt in and the opt out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, it is complicated, but I think it's less complicated than than maybe we've given you the impression. Let me try to make sure I, okay. I clarify that. So the opt-in, opt-out is a mechanism to ensure that whatever is not captured by the proposal doesn't leave any sitting judge less, less or, or somehow dissatisfied. We allow them to, to, to capture what they have. And so that's only a snapshot window in time. That is to say, it's not in perpetuity. New judges would all be in the new system. And so it's just a transition piece. 
the when you say the federal judge component and the inflation adjusted component those are one and the same so as it sits today the federal district courts well all federal uh, article three judges get a regularly calculated uh, increase that is linked to inflation so there's a formula they publish it and then that is what comes out what our plan suggests is that the the linkage for purposes of the appropriations process would be a percentage of federal district court pay, you know, in the proposal is 100% for Supreme Court, 95 for Court of Appeals, and, and, and always pegged to that number, so that when we submit to you our budget request, in, in, in current world, when we submit to you a budget request and you have interest in increasing judicial pay, we can't do that. You have to do it, and to do it, you have to go find money elsewhere within a budget that's already fully subscribed. The maximum authorized model would say, here is what that percentage would be, and you have the budgetary discretion and control over that in, in, in setting it, so long as it's not less than what it was a year ago, because there's a constitutional provision in play there. But you have control over that, but so that our proposal to you allows you to keep pace with the rate of pay over time, as opposed to having long gaps where there's no action and the relative buying power of those dollars is decreasing over time. I don't think that you have anybody else in, in the state system that, that has anything like that to answer that question. Um, we're a relatively small sample set if you want to explore whether that works uh, in terms of just numbers and head counts that are there. Um, it certainly wouldn't obligate you in any other way. But does that, it's not, those aren't two separate metrics. Those are, it's just one thing. And so it would be, it would be the locality pay would simply be just 10% of whatever the uh, authorized state salary was. So whatever you were paying, a county could not exceed 10%, or counties if it's a multi-county circuit could not exceed 10% of that in an effort to try to avoid the runaway effect that we have seen since 1904. One quick follow-up. Right. Um, so uh, the, the marker or the percentage is so 190, and that's where I missed in the, in the presentation, 195. 90, for, 92, 90, uh, right. business court. And, right. Thank you. Yeah. Judge Messier, if you want to, do you want to say something right quick? Uh oh. <laughs> okay, not me. Um, very quickly, just for context, um, so most of you know um, and have something to do with Georgia being the number one state to do business. Um, and the Georgia Court of Appeals has kind of, as you might guess, our business has increased because your business has increased. Um, and what I just for context purposes, Georgia has one of the busiest intermediate appellate courts, if not the busiest intermediate appellate court in the nation. We also have one of the broadest jurisdictions of any intermediate appellate court in the nation. What that means is our, juris our jurisprudence, what we cover, the law that comes to us in the first instance, is bigger than it is in most jurisdictions. In addition to that, we cover the entire geographical state of Georgia. Many, many intermediate appellate courts do not. They are broken down into regions, and so you may have a panel of judges that sit in one small region where we have 15 judges covering the entire state, which means any single opinion that I write is binding precedent on the entire state. Whereas in certain jurisdictions, for example, our neighbors to the south in Florida, they may have an opinion that they write that is only binding in the jurisdiction that they're in, which means you can literally have differing parts of the state with different law or in different interpretations. Georgia is not like that. For context, at one time, Georgia, the, the Court of Appeals was number six in the nation. We've now fallen to number 23. So for context purposes, I just want everyone to be aware that, that we are here to do the state's business. As the, as the state gets busier, we get busier. We have constitutional deadlines that we are bound to, to follow and adhere to. We are grateful beyond measure for any help that can be given at any time because it is a very, very important job. I can't understate how much time and effort our staff puts into it. We are losing them. One final point, our staff attorney speaking with the issue of retention, we are not just losing 
our staff attorneys are not being able to recruit them. We're losing the people that we've had that are like the institutional knowledge of our court. We are losing them by the day because we cannot give them anything else. We have people that cannot get a raise except for whatever COLA or cost of living, whatever, whatever comes from the state. There's nothing that we as a court can give them. And so we have people that have been with our court for years who are the heart of our court and help us meet those constitutional deadlines. We can't, we can't keep them. So it's not just that we're losing people, it's that we're losing the people that help us do this business and we're losing them to not only big firms, but we're losing them to other governmental entities. And so all I am asking for today is just your, your consideration and anything that you are willing to do for the courts of the state of Georgia, I am truly grateful for. Thank you, Judge Mr. Here. Chairman Tillery. Thank you, Mr. Hatchett, Chairman Hatchett. Um, the, some of our members could not be present. I'm going to try to sum up five of their questions very quickly. Okay, the first one would be: I found the uh, idea of balanced cases among circuits intriguing. Has any other state tried a per diem model? I'm looking at my staff back there. I'm not, I am not aware of any state that has done, has pursued a per diem model as it relates to that, no. The Senate has been focused on juvenile, the juvenile court backlog. Here's what I'm going to do on that question. If you guys don't mind, please, uh, those who are responding, would be responding to that. Let's have a discussion offline and be ready to talk about it in January. Uh, and do expect that question about the juvenile court backlog and where we've moved, if that thing has moved at all. I think the next, the next two came from the same person, so I think they're related. What is the vacancy rate among the judiciary? You have, you have three. Okay, we have three on the Superior Court. Um, we have one on the Court of Appeals that's vacant right now. Okay. Um, what's that? Yeah, so for the JNC uh, that I serve on interviews candidates for appointment to open judgeships. We have one in the Appalachian Circuit we just interviewed, one on the Court of Appeals we just interviewed. Um, we have three on Superior Court uh, upcoming. Um, those are the only ones that JNC is aware of, um, but I know there are others coming because I know one Superior Court judge that's getting ready to leave at the end of next year. So if you're just speaking about judges. I think it would be to your staff as yeah, well. Yeah, right. Much broader question. I because that your percent is going to be less than one percent there. If, I don't yeah, think. If, if the chair would allow, I mean that is data that we can probably gather. I, okay. I don't know it off the top of my head, but but I'm looking at my staff team back there, and they're I'm sure rolling their eyes. But but they <laughs> but we we can try to gather in terms of the vacancy piece. I, I will also note in terms of the turnover piece when this commission when this committee rather uh, was doing its research. One of the data points we were looking at is how familiar the judges were with the 2016-17 proposals. Over 25% of our sitting Superior Court bench was not a Superior Court judge in 2016. And when we talk about throughput and caseload and backlogs, judging is not something you just walk into. And the fact that we have a, a relatively low tenured uh, judiciary right now whether it's all related to compensation departures or not, is, I think, a relevant, consider, relevant consideration uh, for the process. I would include staff in that, if I mean, for that answer to that question. Yes, we'll, 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 we'll um, call that. I think it was, is PAC, and in that figure, is PAC considered a member of the judiciary? Would be the next question. So when y'all answer that. Can we get back to you? They're up, ne <laughs> they're up next. They're next. Last is, seems more like a comment, and it was just a uh, local supplement. Concerning the local supplement not ending, I fear this would possibly create the current problem in the future. So just giving you a heads up as thank to what you, one Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we, the committee discussed that at length. I think it is uh, a legitimate concern. That, that is why the cap of 10 percent was in place, was the recognition that when you look at current cost of living differentials, differentials across the state of Georgia from rural areas to urban areas, 10% delta seems to be capturing most places. It's probably true that sort of the urban center of Atlanta exceeds 10%. I mean, at least the data that I've, I've surveyed. But in any event, the idea was that there's likely to always be some differential uh, okay. between cost of living. And so the, the idea was 10% would, would account for that, but not allow it to run away. That's the 14% that didn't agree with it. Uh, <laughs> Judge. 
Do you, I, I don't know your last name. I apologize. Judge Morris. Judge Morris. Thank you. It's Morse like code. <laughs> Uh, but to, uh, and you can use Morse code if you like. So we'll get we'll get out of here quick. I, I actually do know it, but uh, I don't know how many here still use it. But I, I could probably do a little bit of it. Uh, but we are here to answer any questions that anyone have. And to uh, the, the uh, representative question with respect to the judges uh, overall of that 86 percent, actually a good third of those judges are not going to see any immediate increase in salary. So to say, when we indicated to get 86% of us to agree with respect to a pay increase, true, anytime there's going to be any pay increase, you're going to rally the troops with respect to that aspect of it, but the majority of us are not going to really see that to any extent. And so what we understand and we stand in solidarity with our appellate brethren and sisters is to understand that there is the need to make sure that the judiciary is compensated in such a way that the business of this state gets taken care of. The reason why they're so busy is because the state is busy and there are 222 of us constantly sending stuff to them for them to review. Uh, we have to call the balls and the strikes on the ground level. They get to do the instant replay. But uh, it, it, it's dealing with the daily lives of people from the moment that they wake up until the time they go to bed. And actually, it's from life to death. So dealing with those particular issues on a daily basis, it requires us to make sure that we are doing it in such an efficient and effective way as much as possible and compensation to a great extent goes to judicial wellness as well. So we're asking for this body to uh, rally behind the judiciary in such a way to make sure that the citizens of this particular state, this great state that we're serving in, are going to be uh, protected, they're going to receive the type of justice that is necessary, and they receive justice in such a way that is done without there being the cloud and tension of the issue of compensation going on between its ranks. So when everyone is of the same mindset, everyone is of the same particular uh, vogue, we understand what our responsibilities are. We understand that uh, there is uh, accountability and transparency that's going to be required with respect to the, 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 not to say the lower aspect of it, but we're on the ground level of what goes on when it comes to the judiciary to a great extent being the constitutional general officers with general jurisdiction. We hear everything, okay? Uh, deciding whether what parent is going to have a child, deciding whether or not someone is going to be executed, things of that particular nature. These are life decisions that are being done on a daily basis and sometimes on, as we say, a fly. We don't get to do it like they do it on television. It is real life, it is real issues that we have to deal with that are very complicated, they're very sensitive, and so we're going to uh, understand that with the help that you give us that we will have the responsibility to be accountable to that. We have the responsibility to be transparent with respect to that and we take that very seriously. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers today and those here representing them. Um, we know you have a very important job in this state and we all appreciate what you do. And we know that this is a very important issue to you and to all of us. Um, I think you have successfully been accomplishing a huge rally cry already. So continue to do that as we return in January. And thank you for all being here. Thank you. Thank you all again for being here. We're going to keep rolling at 2.15. If members need to... If you need to walk out and use the restroom really quickly, please do quietly. The next group will be either another group of the judiciary or not. We'll find out uh, from prosecuting attorney's counsel. And prosecuting attorney's counsel, you can come on up.
a complete pleasure. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I don't. Okay. Thank you. We got a little PowerPoint plug in here. She's coming, I think. All righty, if you don't mind, uh, please return into your seats. And if you still have a conversation that needs to continue, if you don't mind taking it out to the hallway. Ready? All right. Let's see if I get this thing to work. Got it. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question? Sir? Mr. Chairman, is it, is it unusual for the lawyer legislators to leave when the judges leave, or is that just a coincidence? Did y'all notice that? I think they have, uh, they've timed their bladders the same, so they all had to run to the restroom at the same time. That's what the judiciary helps us. <laughs> Representative Donahue said they were charging by the hour. All right, thank you so much, and we have our distinguished district attorney from the Coweta Circuit to uh, begin today's presentation. It's good to see you again. Good to see you all. So I'm Herb Cranford. Uh, like the chairman said, I'm the DA in the Coweta Circuit. That's uh, Coweta, Carroll Troop, Meriwether Heard. Um, I'm also our, uh, the DA's Association Budget Chair. So um, I, I was the only person to volunteer for this job, just so you know. But. Um, I, I appreciate you all uh, having us and listening to us. Um, just to give you a little context for, for my interest in this, um, I, I've been the DA since 2018. Uh, I was an intern in the DA's office that I'm now the DA of. Um, before that, my, my father and grandfather were elected solicitors in Coweta County. So I'm a third generation prosecutor and um, I care deeply about what we do and the impact we can have on victims, obviously, but also defendants and, and the families of both. Um, it, it's, it's consequential work. And to do the job effectively, we need people that um, not only care about it, obviously, and find it fulfilling and are willing to do it for less money than they can make in private practice, but um, people that, that you know, have a passion for it and want to do it as a career. And so the, the presentation I have for you today is basically making the point we don't believe we have competitive pay for our assistant DAs, and we want to get more competitive. And, and the purpose is having career prosecutors, people that, that know how to prosecute a child molestation case, a murder case, somebody that, God forbid, something like that happens to somebody in your family, you would feel comfortable with this assistant DA handling your case. And, and right now, um, we're, we're struggling, to be honest. Um, the, the presentation we're making, um, all the dollars you're hearing about, um, our budget program, it's 98% salaries and benefits. Um, that, that's where all this money's going, and, and I'm not here asking for money for DAs. This is all about the people in our offices. Um, I, I can't function as DA if I don't have good people, and, and it's hard to recruit people now. It's hard to retain people, and we think if, if – if we get what we're asking for, it's going to make a, a, a significant difference in recruitment and retention. Just to give you an idea, um, currently where we start state-funded ADAs, just so you know, uh, some offices like my office get county funds, and we can use that to hire people as well. Um, not every DA's office gets county funding. Some don't particularly in rural areas. But right now for state funded ADAs, we start at a little over $58,000. The request we're making of y'all would get our starting salary up to about $71,000. That's, that's still below what some of our counterpart uh, government lawyers in the criminal system would make. Right now we're below um, um, what other government funded lawyers that practice criminal law make. Um, and getting us up to 71 would get us close to parity. 
we, um, the top of the scale for the proposal we're giving y'all, right now the top of the scale is at 119,000. So people that, that have 18 years experience or more, the career prosecutors, the ones that you want handling your, your family member's murder, you know, sex crime case, they're maxing out at 119. Our proposal would increase that to 128,000. You know, um, that, that, that would make an, a difference to them and, and, and help us keep them rather than them leave uh, when they max out at the scale. This is just a, a snapshot of uh, our four classes on our pay scale and the average salary at each class. So one, one thing we're proposing, that 10 year mark in my experience is important. Um, sometimes we can recruit people out of law school. Um, they know they can get a lot of trial experience with us and then they, they leave to go to private practice, um, even locally, become a defense attorney locally, or they use the experience they get with me kind of in a, a more suburban rural circuit to go get paid a lot more in, in a urban DA's office that has a whole lot of county funding. So where we want to take that, you know, that person that's 10 years experience from making, you know, $88,000, $90,000 to over $100,000. If I can tell somebody out of law school, if you stick with me for 10 years, you're going to be making over $100,000. I think that's something that would be attractive and compelling to them. And, and if I can keep them that long, they'll have roots in the community, and maybe that's somebody that turns into a 20-year prosecutor. You know, that, that's, that's uh, I think, the, the kind of significant point, the five-year mark, the 10-year mark, and, and, and I think that's a compelling pitch we can make, getting over 100,000 at 10 years. Because right now, you can go to some other DA's offices fresh out of law school and make $85,000, $90,000. You know, we're, you know, the, the disproportionate impact of this budget request is going to be to the benefit of, of rural offices, frankly. It would help everybody, but it's really, really going to help the smaller offices. Speaking of the smaller offices, um, these are our current vacancies. Uh, as of November 23, 2023, we've had 36 uh, state-funded ADA openings across the state of Georgia. Um, we've averaged around 40, sometimes over 40, the last few years. Um, it's been a significant problem. Um, can, I, can I stop you right there? Will you help me? Because yeah. this is going to lead to one of the questions later. What are the total yeah. number of positions so I can figure out the vacancy percentage? Because we keep up with like DJJ. We know it's 110% vacancy and turnover. We yeah, know we, corrections is if, 40. If I recall correctly, is it 293 T total ADAs in the state? 429. 429, yeah, sorry. So four, about 9%. Yeah, okay. and, and I've, uh, I can jump ahead for you real quick just to show you. Yeah, so um, state-funded ADA positions, 426. Here's the, the, the turnover percentages we've had. Um, the 43 numbers an outlier, that, that was a lot of new DAs getting elected in 2020. So that's why it was so high then. But, but the last two years, it's still been over 20% turnover um, out of 426. So it's... Uh, a significant problem. My office, for example, I've got 23 full-time assistant DAs, some state funded, some county funded. The last three years I've lost 19 ADAs that I've had to replace. And, and generally speaking, they're getting less experienced, you know. So we, we, we've become a, a much less experienced office and, um, you know, it, it gets more difficult. I mean, these are people you're asking to go in front of all these judges and competently present a case about somebody shooting somebody or somebody being, you know, the victim of a sex crime. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's been very, very difficult, to be honest with you. So going back to this, this is just a map to give you a sense of, of where all these circuits are. Um, as the Chief Justice said, 50 circuits, that means 50 DA's offices across the state of Georgia. Most are multi-county. Current vacancies, uh, like I said, we've got 36. The Patala circuit and the Cordell circuit, that's southwest Georgia and kind of south central Georgia, their only ADA positions are state funded positions. They get no county funds. And right now, um, those circuits, 
you know, have three and four openings. So they're at 50% capacity um, and, and, and they're struggling to recruit and retain people um, in those offices. You know, I, I'm close enough to Atlanta where I've been able to fill my spots, albeit with much less experienced people. But um, across the state, particularly in rural offices, um, it's, it's, it's very difficult. There's the turnover uh, we just addressed. And so this gets to uh, kind of the, the, the actual numbers on what we're requesting. Um, that the $15 million amount, like I said, 98% of the DA program is salaries and benefits. Our, our employer costs are 70% uh, roughly. I think it's like 69% and some change. So, so uh, literally 70% of that almost is going to uh, employer costs. The rest is going to salaries. Um, ha happy to address any of these uh, other details here, but, but obviously the, the, the real bulk of this is going to the ADAs increasing um, where we're starting people we're talking about staying on the same pay scale, but, uh, but, but getting those new ADAs up to 71, getting a 10-year ADA over 100, and getting the career prosecutor maxed out at 128. We think that gets us much more competitive where those people that find our work fulfilling, and I mean, I, I think this is the best lawyer job you can have. I mean, you, you get to step into a situation and say, this isn't right, I'm gonna do something about it. Um, and, and I think this proposal helps me keep people that feel the way I do about prosecution. And, and quickly, um, um, the, the head of uh, the Prosecuting Attorneys Council um, had a pre-scheduled conference, so he couldn't be here this week. So um, just to kind of run through the PAC program, um, this is their request. Again, most of this is focused on retaining and recruiting uh, prosecutors that work at PAC. Um, next, uh, there's another program for conflict prosecutors. Um, with the 2020 election, there were a number of uh, DAs elected that had been handling criminal cases. So there's a lot of conflict cases throughout the state of Georgia. My, my office is personally handling 30 or 40 cases out of uh, the Muskogee uh, or the Chattahoochee circuit, which includes Muskogee County. Um, and, and PAC is also, uh, there's a couple lawyers through this program that are helping handle those conflict cases throughout the state of Georgia. So that's, uh, again, most of this is going to um, um, giving some raises to those conflict prosecutors. And I guess the, the, the final point, which I've made a couple times, is for the DA budget that we're proposing, it gets a 10-year ADA from $88,000 to $110,000. Um, that, that's something I think I can sell to my people that, that would make a significant difference. Happy to take any questions. You do have a few questions. I think uh, the first one comes from Representative Bonner. Hey, thank you. Uh, thanks for being here today. The uh, question I have is, uh, has there been any, any kind of assessment to determine if these recruitment and retention issues are, the, are does it all come down to money or does it come down to um, the environment in that particular DA's office? I, I think that certainly matters. You know, um, you know um, how court is conducted can affect whether you know, an ADA finds their job fulfilling. Um, as an assistant DA, one thing that I found very fulfilling was um, you know, having the authority and discretion to do what I thought was the right thing to do on a given case. So I think there are things about how an office is run, how court is run um, by, by the players in the judicial system. All that can affect whether you find the job fulfilling, where you, whether you feel like you're making a difference. I mean, people attracted to this job, like, they're willing to take less money if they feel like what they're doing matters and, and is making a difference. So would you agree then that it is important to elect good district attorneys? Uh, as, as one who hopes I'm a good district attorney, yes, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chairman Tiller. So 
where your turnover rate, you've shown us your turnover rate. Do you know how that compares with the public defenders? I do not. Okay. I do not. And so when you're, as far as turnover, when, when your ADAs are leaving, where where are they? Do you, can you, where is there a place they're going, or is it just all over the board? Certain I, place we're I, losing them nowhere. I, I've heard from a couple DAs who um, ha, have lost potential hires to public defenders' offices, for example. Um, from my office, um, almost all of them either went into private practice to become a defense attorney, or went to a, a Metro DA's office. I think I had one, maybe two, go to the Attorney General's office. Yeah. Fine. Uh, Chairman Dolezal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for joining us today. Um, do you all consider yourselves part of the judiciary? I, I know in the Constitution um, we're in the judicial branch. It is now, you know, what type of power we wield is, is a different question, I think, that I don't know the answer to. Right. I had a follow-up, that's okay, Mr. Chairman. Um, as it relates to this, this um, Compensation proposed change. What's the current vacancy rate across the state? I think, like I said, it's uh, the vacancy rate. What'd you say? Nine percent is the current vacancy rate. Yeah. Yeah. That's turnover. Yeah. So I don't know if I have a slide, but yeah, we've got what we say thirty something ADA openings out of 400 positions. Yeah, so right at 9%, I believe. So you have, you have incredible turnover, but you have been able to replace a number of them under the current compensation. Yeah, I think, I think we've maintained roughly a 10% vacancy rate for a few years. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Our next will be our state's attorney general, General Carr. No pressure, Mr. Attorney General, but we're caught up now. All the all the judges, all the justices and justices, they all wanted to talk and they got us behind, so we're caught up. So no no pressure. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Hatchett, Chairman Tillery. Thank you both, the members of the committee, for giving us the opportunity to provide an update in two areas. One is the FY24 appropriations that you provided in HB19. The other is our FY25 and AFY24 budget requests. Starting with FY24 appropriations, I'll start with the human, tra human trafficking analyst that you provided for us, along with the support of First Lady Marty Kemp, this committee funded one analyst position within the Department of Law's Human Trafficking Prosecution Unit that has enabled us to identify and go after illicit massage businesses throughout the state. The IMB project officially launched on September 1st, 2023, and to date we have conducted 30 investigations into potential IMBs and have elected to proceed with efforts to close 24 of those locations by notifying landlords and working with them to address the illicit activity. To date, our work has resulted in the closure of five illicit massage businesses, and the remaining locations are pending potential closure, the majority of these landlords have taken significant steps towards evicting their tenants, and we anticipate more closures as those legal proceedings are completed. Second issue is the digital evidence management system, and I want to thank this committee for its funding for our digital evidence management system for our gang and human trafficking prosecution units. Building gang cases and collecting digital evidence requires our office to store and, and retain incredibly large amounts of data, in particular video data. There's been a proliferation of video evidence used in criminal cases and an expectation of juries for the presentation of video evidence. We collect much of this evidence from local authorities, such as in-car, body camera, and municipal video surveillance, and from private sources, such as doorbell cameras, business surveillance, hotel surveillance, and airport surveillance systems. We've been working with subject matter experts to develop this system. 
which will enable us to more efficiently upload and search evidence files, leading to more effective investigations and prosecutions of human trafficking and gang cases. And again, we appreciate the committee's support. FY24 salary increases. Uh, finally, as you may recall, last year in FY24, our office pro proposed merit-based salary increases for our attorneys to help address recruitment and retention, and we are very grateful for this committee's support. In addition to the funding for the $2,000 COLA, you appropriated funds for, uh, for year one of a three-year plan to address our overall salary enhancement request. You appropriated uh, $1,624,964, and we're appreciative of your support. And again, as background for why this was important, <clears throat> we have been regularly losing attorneys to other state government positions, in addition to federal and uh, local governments, as well as to the private sector, because our salaries, quite frankly, just haven't been able to keep pace. For example, our base starting salary for an attorney is $67,000, while many private sector firms are paying, and particularly in Atlanta, are paying over $200,000 base plus bonus. Our, one of our senior human trafficking prosecutors recently took a $45,000 pay increase to go work for a local DA's office. We are experiencing five-digit pay gaps between AG prosecutors and county prosecutors, and many former employees have recently left for increases of between $25,000 and $50,000 within state government. Our turnover rate grew from 8.99% in 2018 to 16.67% in 2022. So we are very appreciative of you all and your support by funding our year one or of the year one of our request, which brings me to our FY25 budget requests. Salary increases. We are asking for the year two salary enhancement of $1,624,964. Your continued support will allow us to better recruit and retain attorneys so that we can continue to provide quality legal representation to the state while keeping SAG costs to agencies down. Because the reality is, as I mentioned last year, the state will continue to get sued, will continue to have litigation needs, and will continue to have legal representation costs. So we can either continue to invest in the Department of Law to provide agencies with representation at no cost to the agency, or we'll be forced to go to the private sector to hire SAGs, which the agencies will have to pay out of their own budgets, effectively acting as a litigation tax on those agencies. But the good news is that every year we generate a revenue source, which we send to Treasury, talked about this last year, for this committee to use to appropriate, and it can pay for our requests. Over the prior seven fiscal years, we've brought in, on average, over $15 million to send to the state treasury through our consumer protection efforts. This is money that our, off our office generates each year and the state does not plan for. Additionally, since July 1 of this year, we've already brought in over $20 million and sent it to the treasury. And Chairman, we have sent those to you all as well, keeping you guys posted, but that's over $20 million that we've brought just this year. And so we're asking that you consider using those funds as you consider our requests. In fact, the $20 million alone from this year would justify funding our entire salary proposal for nearly three and a half years, and we're only halfway through the year. I also want to thank, uh, there was a suggestion last year in this, uh, in this meeting that we put our settlements up on our website. We have done that. You can find it on our website in the settlements, under the settlements page. We're also going to ask for an organized retail crime and cyber crimes prosecution unit. We're asking for $1,245,076 for this ORC and, consumer, uh, and cyber crimes unit. Organized retail crime and cyber cr crime clearly are statewide issues. As they continue to grow and become more sophisticated, the impact to Georgia and our citizens is significant and weighs heavy on our economy. Our office is requesting dedicated resources to support the business community, victims, and law enforcement by prosecuting these cases. Georgia businesses lose over $3 billion per year to retail theft annually. And these organized retail crime rings are violent and brazen. 76% of retail asset protection managers at the various retailers surveyed said that an ORC criminal has physically assaulted an associate, 
a customer, or has threatened to use a weapon. ORC rings can have ties to other criminal activities as well, such as human and drug trafficking. ORC rings are also targeting our world-class logistics network by focusing on cargo. Cargo theft is on the rise and strikes at the heart of one of the factors that draws businesses to Georgia, which is our logistics network. So in order to remain a top state for business, we believe we need to dedicate resources to protecting those businesses from these criminals. Also, Georgia victims lose over $320 million per year to cybercrime. And uh, last year alone, we had 13,415 Georgians that reported that they were victimized, and that's just the people that reported it, and we know a lot of folks don't report. So in addition, today's cyber landscape has provided ample opportunity for criminals and adversaries to target U.S. networks, attack our critical infrastructure, hold our money and data for ransom, facilitate large-scale fraud schemes, and threaten our national security. So our proposal consists of an 11-person prosecution unit comprised of prosecutors, investigators, analysts, and support staff, again, in the amount of $1,245,076. And we're also requesting $232,500 for equipment and technology to support this unit's work. ORC and cyber crimes continue to grow and are multi-jurisdictional in nature. So this unit would, be allowed, would allow the state to partner with federal, state, and local law enforcement to prosecute these crimes statewide. The gang prosecution unit, we are requesting $774,011 to expand our gang prosecution unit. As you all know, gangs and violent crime impact all communities in Georgia. They're a threat to our safety, to our well-being, and the quality of life that we have in this state. In Georgia, the Georgia Gang Investigators Association estimates that there are over 1,500 criminal street gangs in Georgia. There are over 71,000 active gang members in the state, and an average of 60% uh, of, of violent crimes committed are gang motivated. The governor and this legislature have continued to prioritize significant resources, including the creation of the GBI's statewide gang task force and our gang prosecution unit, and we are thankful for that support. Our gang prosecution unit has indicted 89 alleged gang members since July 1st, 2022, and has secured 25 convictions since April alone this year. However, we only currently have a presence in Atlanta, Augusta, and Albany, and for that reason, we're requesting additional resources to expand our efforts by adding one investigator and one prosecutor to each region in Columbus, Macon, and Savannah. The presence of a gang prosecutor and investigator in each of these regions of the state will help us better address violent crime, leverage our resources with federal, state, and local law enforcement, and allow us to operate with more of a statewide footprint. And AFY 24, so lastly, I just want to touch on our amended fiscal year 24 uh, request. We are requesting funding to address our one-time uh, in information technology needs and to obtain vehicles for our investigators. Our IT enhancements are consistent with our strategic plan to improve IT infrastructure, security, and efficiency. And so we're requesting one time funding of $1,214,348 in AFY24 to help us address cybersecurity needs and to refresh our outdated technology. First, under our plan, we'd utilize one time funds to hire contract IT professionals to help us address network security needs, which would enhance the cybersecurity of the department. Secondly, roughly 67% of the IT assets in our inventory system will be more than three years old by the end of FY24, which is beyond their useful life. The goal for our IT hardware is a three-year lifespan for our computers and scanners, and this funding would enable us to get caught up. And as for investigator vehicles, we're requesting $300,000 for 10 investigator vehicles in the prosecution's uh, division. They would be assigned to both existing and proposed investigators and are vital to the success and thoroughness of our investigations, case preparation, emergency management, and are critical to the safety of our staff. So, Chairman, members of the committee, that concludes our presentation. I know that we have provided more detailed information and support of these proposals to committee staff, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Attorney General Carr. Um, so you, you discussed the gang prosecution unit. Yes, sir. And I, I think you said you, won't, you, you would love to expand that. Do you have, and I don't think you said this, do you have locations sort of picked where you would like to possibly 
yes, sir. increase that appearance or Columbus, Macon, and Savannah. So okay. we're currently in Atlanta, Augusta, and Albany, and we'd like to expand to those other uh, re, uh, metro regions as well. And this is sort of sort of off the cuff here a little bit. What what other and you don't have to answer this, but at some point I'd love to discuss it with you. What other tools do we need in this state to to address rising crime? What, what else? Do, what else can we do? Well, I'll answer. I'd love to keep the conversation going, but I'll answer it right now. I think when you have these issues like with gangs, human trafficking, organized retail crime, anything that's multi-jurisdictional in nature, the way that we've tried to do it is leverage the resources that each federal, state, and local law enforcement has. We're not trying to take anything away from DAs. They're the tip of the spear. They're the ones that Herb and his team, they're the ones that deal with all felonies and misdemeanors. But if you've got a gang, uh, I'll just give you an example, organized retail crime. One of our big box retailers gave me a briefing. They showed a group that was hitting every one of their stores coming down 75, going over 285, up 85 into South Carolina and North Carolina. Well, that would be six, seven, eight different judicial circuits. DA certainly could handle that, but from a judicial efficiency standpoint, it would make more sense for the state to come in and have that one unified uh, source uh, to be able to work with federal, state, and local law enforcement. If they're going across state lines, same type thing. But I think, Mr. Chairman, I, I think the, the, the message that's being sent that we are looking at these violent crime issues, gangs, again, gangs don't really care what the city or the county line are. In some cases they may, they may know where somebody's prosecuting cases a little bit different than others. But from our perspective, I think putting those resources, uh, indicting these individuals, we've again had two trials in our gang unit, 25 individuals have been convicted, that starts sending a message. That coordinated and organized approach to law enforcement, I think helps not to take anything away. I have great respect for DAs, sheriffs, chiefs of police, but to be able to overlay additional resources. And when resources are limited, to be able to leverage the resources that we all have and coordinate it leads to better outcomes, in my opinion. I have a quick follow-up question on that. Sure. As you know that we've, and you heard some of the testimony in earlier uh, presenters, we have based public safety in the past on really a local and state partnership, uh, funding, uh, among other things. When you go into these jurisdictions, does the state carry the whole tab, or do the locals have a, a contributing factor or a contributing uh, whether it be in manpower or in funds, I, I'd be he very hesitant for us to be stepping in to just bear the whole cost with 11 million people bearing that, that, yeah. that 50,000 should. It's, if, if the people's person that they elected isn't doing it. Sure. And, Chair, we'll go back and we'll see if we can get some specifics for you. But anecdotally and from what my observation is, it's a partnership. I mean, there was a great, we had a, a motorcycle gang that we busted down in southeast Georgia. One of the greatest examples of federal, state, and local law enforcement partnering together, and the way that I saw that, and I'll go back and confirm it, is that everybody was doing their part. Nobody was kind of footing the bill, but ATF had a role that it could play, and the DA down there, and the sheriff, and our office. So everybody was leveraging the resources rather than coming in and overland saying, we'll take it all. But I'll, we'll, get some, we'll get some specifics for you. Chairman Beach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Attorney General, thank you for being here. Thank you for your presentation. Yes, sir. If you remember last year, you talked about how when you had to go to Athens to prosecute cases that a DA would not prosecute, you were stuck with the cost of, of lodging and meals and so on. Can you give me an amount that you have spent this year? You may not have it today, but can I get it from you later? Sure. If you'll, um, if you'll let us compile that, we'll get yeah, that for you. I'd like to know how much you have spent on doing cases that a DA will not prosecute. We'll get you that information. Okay. And there's a bill that was passed out of the Senate to, to stop that, and hopefully it'll get through the House next year. Any more questions? Um, thank you, uh, Attorney General Carr. The, Billing of agencies. My understanding is that, that the Department of Law did bill agencies. I guess if we should not expect that or expect requests in other agencies for billings from the department if we're able to fulfill that um, personnel request. You know, we'll still have to. I mean, there's no doubt we're going to have to use SAGs. 
there's there's no doubt that we'll have to. So when we use a SAG, we bill, or when we have insured billing cases, and right banks can talk a little bit more about how that works. But we cert if if we don't if, if our numbers are down, we can't retain. We have fewer lawyers. It just means we have to go to the private sector more often and increase that SAG bill. Right? Is there anything you might want to comment on that? The vast majority of our representation really costs the state agency nothing. If we hire an outside lawyer or a special assistant, we bill that charge, of course, through to the agency or authority or whatever executive branch entity it might be. We bill everybody for expenses, um, you know, filing fees, deposition costs, things like that. And when this is a minority of the cases, but it is a significant portion of our cases, when the Department of Administrative Services insures the case, the Department of Law bills the Department of Administrative Services an hourly rate for lawyer time on those cases. Okay. That would only be essentially three categories, employment cases, civil rights cases, and tort cases. We don't bill the Department of Administrative Services for workers' comp defense that we do. Why not on comp? That's been the arrangement for a long time that we don't bill them an hourly rate for comp. Okay. Defense. I guess it really play, I was wondering why we bill them at all since we fund it through the agency but the question I guess I could have asked it in the inverse as well but thank you for the right. data on that right and, the, and I'm, I'm not trying to belabor it yeah. for you but, but the, the when you get into insured cases with the Department of Administrative Services we defend cases for them sometimes we find ourselves defending officials that aren't always our clients like um, for example, it can be a member of the judicial branch that we might defend in certain circumstances as a courtesy, essentially. But if they're sued in tort or sued in civil rights, um, we would have their defense unless we had a conflict under our agreement with the Department of Administrative Services. We'd pick up that defense. So, so what so we do is a like little... 1983 cases and right, mostly you, prison if, cases. Like if you had, we have all of those. And if, if okay. you had a 1983, say, against a district attorney, district attorney's in, you know, in, under the Constitution in the judicial branch, but they would ordinarily be our client for purposes of the state self-insurance programs and their coverage. We have an agreement in place that we provide that representation at a, at a rate that we bill to the Department of Administrative Services. And then my last question is completely different in scope. It's, uh, could you speak a little bit about the opioid settlements? How much money have we brought in so far? And where is that funding? I, I know we don't really have a lot of yeah. idea of where that okay, is. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll tell you what I know offhand, and we can certainly provide you a lot of data on that. So we have settlements in place with the three major distributors and with a, a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson called Janssen. We've started receiving payments under those. Those payments have been received by the trust that receives them. The DBHDD commissioner is the trustee of that trust. There are five additional settlements out there. We've received no funding under them, but we will receive funding. How much do we have now? I, I don't know that dollar amount off the top of my head. If I had to if I guessed, Ball, ballpark it, yeah. if I guessed, I would tell you, I think the distributor payments were about $17 million for each year. So, and I believe we've received two or three of those payments. Okay. Gotcha. And then the, the Janssen payment is larger, but uh, Mr. So Chair, I would be, I would be guessing if I put a dollar number on it, but it's a larger payment because that settlement is front loaded essentially in the way we received that money. Okay. There are five additional settlements out there. We've received no money under those. And those, again, there's an, there's an MOU in place related to those with the local governments. And the, the share breaks down a little differently there. 25% goes to the local government. 75% comes to the state of the state's portion. A piece goes into the trust and a piece goes into the treasury and is available for appropriation subject to a million conditions on the use right. of the funds. Would you agree with me though that we're talking about in excess of 50 million dollars easy? Oh I wouldn't have any problem saying that that number is right. 
I mean, I, I think it's a, I'm just trying to shoot it low. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that you, Yeah, thank you. you. Thank you, Attorney General Carr, for being here today. Yes, sir. I had a couple of constituents call me um, after your office settled some cases as it relates to the state health benefit plan and paying for what's become known as gender affirming care. Um, can you walk us through the rationale for that settlement, how many cases there were, and then what the fiscal impact was? Uh, for those t for those settlements the settlement was based on the facts and the law of those cases and as far as the financial I'd have to get it to you okay I, I read somewhere that we had to pay attorneys fees as well do you do you know what that number was I'd have to get that for you okay um, I know the plaintiff's attorney also mentioned um, that it was his opinion or her opinion that we would under the state health benefit plan now be paying for um, these surgeries for minors I think, as you know, we passed a bill last year, I think it was Senate Bill 140, that outlined Which we're defending. these procedures. Yeah. Do you agree with their assessment that the settlement would require um, the state health benefit plan to cover these surgeries for minors? Uh, I'm going to answer it this way. The facts of that case were the facts of that case. I have joined a number of different lawsuits around the country, amicus briefs, that would argue the other way, that would defend our law, will continue to defend the state's law like we always have. And that was one particular case. So, and I'm not as quick as you are, so I apologize. That's okay. Um, the, as it relates to the state health benefit plan and minors and, and Senate Bill 140, is Senate Bill 140 still in effect? We are and defending we'll, Senate Bill 140 that we think the law has not changed in any way, great. shape, or form. Thank you very much. You got it. Any more questions? You're free. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you to all. Appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you, Attorney General. All right. Next up is Commissioner Thompson with the Department of Labor. Where is he? Floor is yours, Commissioner. Or the podium, or whatever you want. Good, how are you? Good to see you. Ready? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, the Department of Labor is a story of good, bad, and the ugly. Please allow me to begin by just sharing a little bit of the good news we have about this agency. And it is indeed a new day. We continue to attract and develop great leaders at this agency that have brought into the concept of making this agency the top leader department in the country. Many of you are already using the new legislative portal we developed for you that gives you direct access with the, our constituent services team. This team gives you the ability to see where you are in the process of solving a problem you have, or we have, on behalf of your constituent. We recently launched a partnership with the Department of Corrections entitling Walking the Last Mile to ensure we are also doing our part to fill a huge workforce shortage. I made this promise to you and the people of Georgia, and we've delivered. We have much more to share about our progress, but that will become evident as this presentation proceeds. Our great state continues to be recognized as the number one place in the country to do business, the top state in many other categories as well, and there's no reason we can't be the number one labor department in America as long as this agency continues to focus on making that a priority. I testified before this body earlier this year during session and shared that we identified significant challenges as a result of years of neglect of the people, the property, and the processes. At that point, we only knew about some of the more obvious and visible cha challenges, but before long, many others became quite clear, including the hidden $105 million we sent back to the state treasury just a few months ago. Oh yes, and by the way, we are now submitting monthly as we're required. During session, you graciously appropriated $6 million to us that allowed us to immediately begin tackling some of the structural needs 
at headquarters and the career centers throughout the state. Over the past nine months, we've replaced several broken HVAC systems, installed new chillers at Sussex, replaced mold damaged roofs, and repaired all the career centers that had mold and water leaks. When asbestos was discovered, we immediately went to work to remediate it, ensuring that our employees and your friends had a safe and clean environment to work in. Within a few weeks of taking office, we assembled several steering committees to quickly begin a deep dive on the entire agency's operation, which culminated into a collaborative SWOT analysis. We contracted an outside firm to provide our senior leadership with an extensive and detailed roadmap to turn this agency around, with a focus on compliance, efficiency, and effectiveness, the three words this body asked for. The prioritization toward modernization became very evident. Without replacing and modernizing the UI system and moving the other programs off paper and manual processes, this agency would never move past the history of failure and the current year-long backlog of claims. In fact, without additional funding, we'll be unable to replace the staff that was displaced with the move of Wagner Pizer. Some of these career centers around the state are currently operating with less than 50% of the slaughter positions which further impacts the ability to perform in a compliant posture. This year, we administered competency assessments throughout our entire organization, which led to a statewide training and retraining initiative that continues today. We began the process of putting the right people in the right place empowered to make the right decisions. One of the obvious changes with the agency will be testifying in just a moment. Her name is Kate Furman. She is our CFO, and many of you know her from her years of service at the state at OPB, DOT, DHS, and many other agencies. Now, it's important to understand that one of these steering committees was tasked with examining the UI system to see if, indeed, could we fix it or was the only solution to replace it. After a few weeks of intense investigation, it became clear the Department of Labor would never be able to meet the federal or state audit obligations without modernizing the UI system, which was confirmed by both state and federal auditors. Please hear me as leaders of our state. There is a sense of urgency to get this agency's programs and databases in the cloud, not just to make them more efficient, but to protect the personal information from the constant bombardment of attackers. The UI system must also be replaced as quickly as possible if we desire the state to become federally compliant and avoid the inevitable, which is a downgrade of our state's bond rating. These aren't empty threats. They're warnings that we receive from our auditors, federally and state, that are continuing to be on site today. The UI Steering Committee consisted of former COO, our current CIO, our Executive Council, our UI Director, and many others, without me. That was intentional. They traveled to other states to modernize, met with our state stakeholders like audits and DOAS, as well as NASWA, they interviewed six specific vendors that contacted the agency with an interest in demonstrating their services. In total, 61 vendors came to our site and were provided the opportunity to present and demonstrate their products and services to the UI Steering Committee and others at the department. I made it clear to this committee, I did not want this to be a closed process, but to ensure everyone was provided the opportunity to show showcase. After significant collaboration with all the stakeholders, federally and within the state, we were faced with a difficult situation. Do we wait until this body reconvenes in January and request $28 million appropriations specific to this project and then ask for other appropriations as we are today, or do we search for federal money? Since the time frame from completing this project is roughly 28 months, the decision was made to go explore federal money with the hope of minimizing the financial impact to our state. We applied and secured the necessary federal funds through a federal grant specifically designed just for state modernization efforts. The only challenge with using this grant was the deadline to encumber the money was September 30th. But we were confident that along with our state partners, we could meet the deadline. During this process, we followed the state procurement process by involving DOAS, and all the other state agencies as required. We followed the bid process by posting it, the project to the state website for bid purposes. Although only one company bid on the project and was subsequently awarded that project, 
No other company exercised their right to object. So again, we encountered no formal objections to the process or the bid process or the bid award. It's important to understand that the previous administration did fail to encumber $100 million by their deadline, and that agency, or ours, forfeited the entire amount. That weighed heavy on our minds. We did not want to be the 2.0 of prudent and fiscal failure. The ramifications of not fixing this technological deficiencies with this agency are potentially disastrous to our state's economy. There will be an increase to our employers' UI premiums. The solvency of our trust fund will be at risk from increased threat from fraudsters. Georgia's state bond rating will once again be at risk of a downgrade, and yours and my constituents will not receive the benefits in a timely manner. Before handing this off to both Kate and Janelle, I want to remind you of a commitment that I made to each one of you, my former colleagues, and in addition to the lobbying committee. Lobbying committee. I promised this agency would be transparent. I promised it would be collaborative, and I promised we would be cooperative under my leadership. I promised to tear down the walls of silos and singularity-focused departments at the agency and transform the Department of Labor from being transactional into relational. We have a long way to go to achieve this greatness at the agency. I understand that. But I'm confident that we have conducted ourselves in accordance with those promises over the past year. I hope this gives you some insight to where we are and where we plan to go. I have Kate Furman, our CFO here, that is going to take you through our request. It's important for all of us to understand where this agency was, where it currently is, and where we plan to go. Kate? Good afternoon, committee chairs, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for um, entertaining us today, or hopefully vice versa, too. Um, so I am pleased to be able to present, if I can figure out how to do it, our budget request. Um, so as Commissioner mentioned, we did remit the $105 million and are continuing to do that every single month. We have remitted about $8.4 million um, in total, um, and so that will be in total as of December 15th when we submit our November receipts. Um, he's talked a little bit about the modernization project, desperately needed. I've had several conversations with our state auditor, Greg Griffin. We still have an audit disclaimer at GDOL. That absolutely cannot be overcome without a new UI system. And I'll a little bit more on that later. Uh, Commissioner mentioned the legislative portal. We hope that will make your lives a bit easier, make your constituents' lives a little easier. And we have worked very, very closely with TCSG to transition um, the Wagner Pizer uh, workforce solutions to them. In terms of overview, and I'm ho you can hopefully this can be seen, but um, you can see we're kind of on a downward trajectory. Um, Certainly we had pandemic funds and, and other kind of funds that helped us tremendously. Those are going away. Um, and so you can kind of see what our overall, and this does include all funds, what our overall funds for the last several fiscal years have, um, have looked like. In terms of our budget request, um, again, modernization, that is a huge theme throughout this. That is um, getting a new UI system, our current UI system was birthed in 1986. Um, I was not then known to state government. I was not even here. Um, I was alive. Um, the backlog, um, we, we're going to talk to you about our backlogs and how we want to resolve those. Our customer service call center at this point is a bifurcated, um, not consolidated, cobbled together, if you will, group of individuals who are doing their best effort, but it really is not meeting what our customers need, expect, desire, nor is it meeting um, your needs. So what we want to do is professionalize and consolidate that customer call center. 
Again, our staff out in the career centers are answering those calls, but when somebody walks in and needs help finding a job or help filing a claim or other kinds of things, they have to get off the phone call as quickly as they can and then help that person who's walking in the door. Infrastructure, I'm going to tend to run through that fairly quickly, and I use the word in probably not its uh, and it's the meaning that everybody's kind of used to, but I will run through that and some positions that we need. Um, Commissioner mentioned assessment services. We do have a vendor who's on statewide contract that is doing assessment services for our agency in three key areas. Cloud migration, um, we are at uh, GDOL running a um, server farm that is not a core competency. It's not something we should be doing. Um, and not only is it a farm, it has a variety of barnyard animals in it, which I would like to see professionalized and moved to the cloud um, and really uh, reduce any risk or, or eliminate, hopefully, but particularly reduce the risk of breach or security issues. I'm going to talk a little bit, but very quickly, about our Work Opportunity Tax Credit. That's a program I was never aware of. And then lastly, the need for some security services and upgrades. If I go at a pace that's not pleasing to you, please stop me and let me know that. <laughs> um, you know our challenges. I'm not going to belabor this slide. You know, all of you here could probably give me a list of things that went wrong during the pandemic. But um, we do obviously have... Um, service challenges. Uh, UI system, I've talked a little bit about that, and we do need 5.5 million in FY25. Commissioner mentioned we have 28 million in hand. We're going to be applying for some more federal funds, but however, we still need this 5.5 million. There's a number of licenses. The other thing that um, was made really clear to the commissioner when he visited some of our USDL partners is we expect the state to have skin in this game. We're, if you think we're going to give you 100% federal funding to fund this big system, you're crazy because we're not. We, we want you to have some skin in the game. So um, that's kind of what that looks like. Um, our hearing officers, we desperately need hearing officers. People have appealed, employers are trying to get the, they want to get their claims adjudicated. It's not fair for either party to be in this holding pattern, waiting to see what happens and what the fa financial ramifications are, either to the business person that's trying to operate that business or to the individual who is trying desperately to support a family. So clearly, having these things hung up is not acceptable. Additionally, USDOL, while they've been patient up to now, and other states have been in this situation as well, um, there will be a time when they will not be patient and we could face some penalties and so forth. Um, we are requesting some um, field tax agents make sure we're enforcing, make sure that folks are paying timely. If they're not, make sure we take in appropriate enforcement action. Um, those penalties and interests, of course, do accrue to state treasury, but primarily we want to make sure that folks are, are aware that there is enforcement if there is a failure to comply. You can see the data um, on our backlogs. Call center, I've just mentioned that, professionalize, consolidate, make that like job number one for a group of professional individuals. So you can kind of see um, some of our latest call information. Longest wait time, I've kind of questioned that, six hours and three minutes. If it were me, I would have probably been the person that had my cell phone on speaker and left it home for six hours and then abandoned it. But um, that, that's kind of what's going on there. Can I, can I ask a question about that while sure. we're there? Um, so call centers, we had an issue a few years with DDS, a few years ago with DDS. And they, they changed the whole way they used the bot technology have, have you talked with them have you looked into what they did just to see if 
something y'all couldn't duplicate? Yeah, we definitely will talk to them. We are using some things called virtual agent and some other things, you know, such as that that are similar. But yes, we will, in fact, um, we, you know, my analyst at House Budget Office actually recommended we talk to them, so we're in the, we'll, we'll be getting that set up. Do you know if the call center will um, be composed of people that speak like good Southern? <laughs> We're not moving it to another foreign country. I have, I can, yeah, it, it will be a Georgia scenario. But I have had that experience where I ha I've had to say per personally, please, Delta, get me somebody who can tell me where my bag is and can speak to me in Georgian. <laughs> so, um, as we go through, yes, we do need a few attorneys. We get massive amounts of open records requests. Um, certainly, we try to avoid um, legal matters and lawsuits, but this kind of business, they're going to happen. Um, this is one that's near and dear to my heart, is we do not have a lead internal auditor um, or an internal auditor, and I really would um, like to see those positions filled. Um, our assessment vendor has um, said that has heavily recommended we do this, and again, this is something in talking with um, Greg Griffin that he would also recommend. Um, two two human resource people, uh, human resources manager. These are critically, if you don't have your infrastructure working correctly, then um, it kind of leads to other issues in the agency. So. This is so that we can run efficiently, that we have really good people in the seats, we recruit, retain, and do all the things we need to do um, and make sure our supervisors and leaders know how to manage our staff. Um, the Career Center, I listened in rapt attention as the judges descri described the salary disparities among the state judges. And um, although we are not uh, you know, quite that complicated with um, local supplements and such, we do have a variety of salaries in the uh, Career Center manager position. So we do want to um, you know, stabilize those and make sure people are getting paid appropriately. We ha like we talked about the, the efficiency assessments, we are making sure that we're doing things um, and where we have gaps, we've got the firm doing a gap analysis. Where are things not working correctly? How can you be better at this? What are best practices? And so we continue um, down this road of assessing and then there will be recommendations that will um, need to be implemented. Again, I've mentioned cloud migration. This is desperately important. It does fit in with the governor's priority of moving applications to the cloud. Um, and so we definitely want to do that. We want to have great disaster recovery. We want to be able to comply with the statewide standards. And again, um, with the very sensitive data that we have, we want to make sure we do not have breaches. Um, work opportunity tax credit, this is a program and of course, I'm brand new to labor, but I never knew about. So if our employers here in Georgia hire some hard to hire, let's say they have some significant barriers, um, but we have targeted groups. They may be SNAP and TANF beneficiaries, veterans with injuries, voc rehab clients, ex-felons, that falls into our last mile initiative. You know, if employers hire these different individuals, they will send us the information to, GDO, to, to us to certify the wages have been paid, that yes, we see that these people have been in fact employed for the required number of months and so forth. That documentation for us then goes to IRS. IRS looks at it and issues tax credits to Georgia businesses. This is, I mean, I was, this is huge to me now, you know, I, it's just huge. So we certify about $210 million of these tax credits, but we're only picking up about 3.5% of the nationwide total. Um, so we've requested some funding for this, these positions. You may, re, you may say, well, this program's gone on a long time. Why are you getting money? Well, in the past, this, this was supplemented by Wagner Pizer, which we no longer have. So we are coming to you to say, please help us 
not only maintain this program, but help us build it, help us mark. I mean, I don't want to market something I don't have staff for because I'll create another backlog. So help us with this and, um, you know, kind of help us move forward and, and help us get in line for those tax credits that IRS issues. Again, these are federal tax credits. Nothing comes out of the Treasury. Um, security and physical security upgrades. Um, we do have an issue of sometimes in different offices it may look like we have good security, but the fact of the matter is we want our employees to not only not have it look like we have good security, but make sure we actually have good security. So you can see some of the things we are asking for in that regard. We did have a situation with our security company up in um, Athens and um, the uh, you can see here there is a security guard's gun left unattended in a cubicle. This is in an office or a career center where often parents may bring in children and others as they seek employment and so clearly not something that we want to uh, to happen. We have submitted um, our capital outlay request and um, we do have some detail. We have some lists that we have actually shared with um, the various budget offices. So if you have particular questions on any of those, um, and we can always send you a list also, but it lists out what, what these are, um, you know, really in a very detailed manner, if they include HVAC, if they include other types of things, roof issues, all of those types of things. Um, and again, this kind of recaps, you know, at a high level what some of those requests are. UI Trust Fund um, solvency is up around the $2.4 million mark. We're not there. We project by the end of the fiscal year we'll be at about $1.8, $1.9 billion. Um, fortunately, in Georgia, we do have a low unemployment rate, so that certainly is working in our favor. And then um, we'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Wow, the board is lit up. No. Any questions? 59. Representative Gamble. Thank you, Chairman Hatchett. Uh, Commissioner, um, I appreciate your comments today. I mean, I, I remember well the 2020 pandemic and the 1,500 requests for help that I got in Bartow County and felt so helpless trying to help people access their money and then to try to figure out what was fraudulent, what was not. I mean, I'm just not in a position to be able to make an informed decision about that. And based on the things that you're putting in place, do you feel like if we were in a situation like that again that we would be able to handle that uh, at least a little bit better? I know it was unprecedented times, but I just recall not ever getting a single email from the department during that time and, and just the helplessness, the helpless feeling that I had during that time. So. so one of the things I said, I would always be transparent and authentic with you. Uh, this body should always be able to get an answer. You've got my cell phone. We now have a legislative um, deputy that's in here with external affairs. You can get to them. Um, but to answer the root of your question, we're seeing an increase in unemployment. We're seeing millions of people move to Georgia, so the demand on unemployment will rise even though we have an economic boom. We're not equipped to be able to handle an increase because the system was never built for scale. And um, so if we happen to have one of those situations, you'll be able to get an answer, but it's not gonna be the answer you're gonna want or our constituents because as of today, we're still nearly a year behind on appeals. We don't have enough hearing officers, so if you don't have enough hearing officers which are specifically trained individuals, you can't deal with those hearings and we're mandated to do that by federal guidelines and requirement. Um, the process of claims, we're getting claims processed within 48 hours, but when I say processed, that means it starts the process. But remember, we have over four billion dollars in fraud so without a new UI system that will use some of the bots and so on that we need to, the fraud will continue. So I know that's not the answer you'd love to hear. But yes, we are putting those things in place, but we desperately have to backfill some of these positions and move to a technologically age to help us. Did that answer your question? 
Probably not the way you wanted. I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Parent. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, um, Commissioner. This is really just a clarification question. On the um, slide, customer service call center, where we discussed that the longest wait time was six hours and three minutes, it says uh, call information is from November 30th, 2023. Is that for that one day, or is that an average over some period of time? That particular day, okay. So may I comment on that, Senator? So Please. we're talking about our call centers. Our average wait time across the agency as of today is almost three hours. You've got a high volume of calls and you've depleted workforce and not the funds to be able to do that. And constitutionally, we have to meet our budget. Certainly. That's oh. why we're trying to move to a call center. And when I say a call center, we don't mean outsourced. We mean put call centers that are GDOL, kind of like the governor's office, but we need the resources to be able to do that to answer those calls. Can I ask a follow-up, um, Commissioner Thompson? Yes. So this, or I should say, Mr. Chairman, um, this particular slide says that the average wait time on that particular day, November 30th, was one minute and seven seconds with this outlier of six hours and three minutes. But your testimony is that the average wait time is more like three hours across the board. It is. I'm I mean, I, I work with the career centers on that. The reason three hours, and one of you may have the question going like, why would the average time be three hours? Because the system is designed to kick someone off past three hours. So I'm not sure how we got to six hours on that one outlier, but the system was designed prior to me that after a three hour hold line, it would disconnect you. Wow. And we're seeing some of those comments coming through our ledge portal right now. All right, thank you so much for your uh, candor. Seems like. Commissioner, I got a question. Well, get, can yes, you, Mr. I, I see the various requests. If you were just to update the UI portal itself, the portal's not the right word, but the UI Program. system itself. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying career, CAD, the career centers, all, all that stuff goes on the side. What is the dollar cost for that? by itself the total cost to the program for an update mm -hmm. the total program is under contract for roughly 57 58 million 58 million 28 of which has already been encumbered from the feds and then there was a I saw recently the 11.2 million dollar award is that part of that 28 or is that on that's in addition to that 28 that's that's an addition because our next year responsibility if they stay on task which there's a requirement to stay on task We'll have a, the next portion of the payment to them would be roughly 10 million. We've encumbered enough that we'll cover that as well. So of the 58, you believe your agency's already been able to encumber 30, what's the number? That 39. Okay. And, and Mr. Chairman, if I may, I truthfully believe we, we could, we could encumber the entire amount or cover the entire amount through federal funding if we continue to do what we're doing. The challenge is, is Kate, um, corresponded or testified when we talked to USDOL they love the fact that we're going down a road but they made it very clear to us we want to see some skin in the game from the state because every other state's done that but frankly there's money out there if we're prudent on our part to continue to go find federal money thank you yes sir any other questions see you in January Commissioner Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, Merry Christmas. Next up is Secretary of State. So when he gets here, he's not here, is he? Oh, he's outside the door. We'll let you walk down the center aisle, Secretary. <laughs> no. Good. Yes, sir. No, we just wrapped up. Well, there he is. I see the Labor Commissioner. Okay, and if I want to go forward on a uh, slide. 
Gotcha. All right, Mr. Secretary, tell us tell us what you asked for uh, for uh, Christmas. Uh, and get a, uh, I'm glad that uh, it's almost a quarter to four, and the chairman is in great spirits. I don't know if it's early Christmas, what it is, or almost sessions over. But I hope you're not telling me you're fixing to change that. <laughs> uh, well, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Hatchett, Chairman Tillery, and members of the committees. Uh, it's good to be with you today to discuss the proposed FY25 budget and the amended FY24. While our office is divided into corporations, elections administration, professional licensing, investigations, securities, and charities, also, we have four administratively attached agencies, the Real Estate Commission, the Georgia Access to Medical Cannabis Commission, the State Elections Board, and also the Engineering and Surveyors Board. But you'll see that the majority of our requests are coming from the well-known division called Elections. Since day one, election security has been my top priority, and it will continue to be so. The system that we have in place now to administer elections in Georgia has been what I call battle tested. We have implemented a system that withstood a level of pu public scrutiny that is unprecedented in our nation's history. Under my watch, we have passed legislation that bans ballot harvesting, created the first audits of election, and expanded those audits due to recent laws that we've put into place here with the General Assembly, an auditable paper ballot system, the strengthening of list maintenance that leads our nation, and we now have voter ID for every form of voting in Georgia. Early, day of election, or absentee, every form of voting has voter ID. With your help, Georgia is now recognized on both sides of the aisle as a national leader in elections. Georgia is recognized as a national leader in elections because it was the first state in the country to implement the trifecta of automatic voter registration, at least 17 days of early voting, which have been called the gold standard, and no excuse absentee voting. We also, many people aren't aware, we also seamlessly verify citizenship when voters register to vote. Georgia continues to set records for voter turnout and election participation, and we've seen the largest increase in average turnout of any state in the 2018 midterm election and record turnout in 2020 and 2022. 2022 achieved the largest single day of in-person voting turnout in Georgia midterm history, utilizing Georgia's secure paper ballot system. Recently, Georgia ranked number one for election integrity by the Heritage Foundation, which is a top ranking for voter accessibility. Also, the Center for Election Innovation and Research uh, gave us a top ranking as well. And we've been tied for number one in election administration by the Bipartisan Policy Center. This has resulted in unprecedented success in the area of elections. Simply, simply put, what we have worked together to put in place has led to the highest level of confidence this state has ever seen. And the numbers prove it. MIT and the University of Georgia conducted a survey earlier this year of Georgia voters, and the results were 98.9% .9 of voters reported no issues casting a ballot. 95.3% reported a wait time of less than 30 minutes. And 97% of voters rated their interactions with poll workers as good or better. Georgia's list maintenance practices have ensured that our voter rolls are the cleanest and most current of any state in the nation. And as I mentioned earlier, due to our excellent data sharing with DDS, we are able to seamlessly verify citizenship at the time of registration. So today I'm here to present the agency's fiscal 2025 budget request and request for the fiscal year 2024 for one time items. This investment, I believe, will ensure that Georgia's continued success in election and voters of Georgia deserve nothing less. In summary, the agency is requesting funding amounting to $32.3 million. And that's the first slide we have here. As you look on that, the bulk of these requests relate to the ever-changing requirements of election security. Equally important are the modernization of the agency's other departments of corporations and professional licensing to provide superior service to our citizens 
and to support Georgia as the number one state in which to do business. At a more detailed level, there are seven major areas making up our request. And this is the summary here of the different items. At the top of the list is the upgrade to our state's voting system. That project and its related personnel requirements amount to slightly over $10.4 million. Details of the project and personnel needs are in the appendix. Needless to say, this involves updates to machines located in all 159 counties and involves 34,000 ballot marking devices and almost 3,800 ballot scanners. It's a very big project with significant logistical requirements. We requested an additional $11.8 million to support the ever-evolving area of election security and voter upgrades. This part of the request includes voting machine power supply requirements, QR code readers, which came primarily from the House uh, last session, election security and audit personnel, and voter education. An additional $3.2 million is in, the, uh, is in this request for voter contact and list maintenance. Details of this request are in the appendix. Updates to our corporation division processing system requires an investment of approximately $3.3 million. The current system is, bond end, is beyond end of life and a replacement is urgently needed in order to, con to continue to provide superior service to our citizens and business community. And finally, the agency's investigation division requests personnel and equipment amounting to just under $500,000 and the professional licensing boards request approximately $400,000. In summary, we have six major projects, and these six major projects make up 92% of the request and almost two-thirds of the total request. $20.2 million is designed to address election security. Half of the remaining 12.1 is the $6 million required to replace and update power supplies for our voting machines. Uh, this request was not funded last year and in itself can pose a potential issue for our election security if not addressed this year. Uh, one other item that needs to be ad, uh, added to the list that just appeared in the last day or so, we will need approval to fund an $80,000 quote to do quality control in redistricting to ensure counties have uh, voters put in the right precincts given the recent changes in the maps. As I've indicated, details for each request are in the appendix and that should resolve most questions that you have. Should you need more information, as always, please reach out to me. My team, which includes my general counsel, Charlene McGowan, our uh, deputy, assistant deputy, uh, secretary of state, or chief operating officer, I guess is his title, official title, Matt Tyser, and then our state election director are here, uh, Blake, to answer any questions you also might have as we drill down on this. But thank you for your time. We got a few questions. Chair Lady Kirkpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. This is actually not about elections. This is about physical therapy licensure. And uh, apparently you guys put in new, um, new system for that that has caused some significant delays that's now required an extension of the expiration date of the licenses. And I wondered what you all are doing to speed up that uh, clearing of that backlog and also how you're communicating with the affected therapists. We uh, broke out with the update of the new Professional Licensing Board uh, software program. We've actually brought, broke that into four different tranches, and that was the first segment that we had. Uh, we were communicating with them, and like you said, we did already extend the deadline for that so they can make sure that they get their paperwork in. Uh, we're working uh, extra time to work on that. It's fairly extensive. We're replacing the MLO system that we've had in the PLB, the Professional Licensing Board, that system was over 20 years old and it just had aged out. And that's why we made the change and that's why we've also done it because we have so many licenses. One of the last license holders we will be doing uh, will actually be in the nursing field and the reason that is that that's our largest group and any issues that we do have, we wanna make sure that those have all been addressed before we attach, attack the biggest uh, issue which will be the you know, huge upswing in the number of nurses we have. But thank you for your question. Could I follow up? Yes. Mr. Chair? Um, so from a communication standpoint, are you all, um, how are you communicating with the physical therapists? Are you emailing them, calling yeah, typically, them? Typically, typically it would be email just due to the numbers that we have. 
but I, I can also circle back with you and get back to the entire committee here uh, with Thank you. your specific question. Chair Lady Mathiak, do you have follow-up to that or a separate question? Good. Thank you, Chairman Hatchett. Um, thank you for being here today, and I have a little follow-up, too, with the physical therapist because I've been getting phone calls as well. Do you have plans to send all the licensing um, employees back to work in Macon, in the office, rather than working from home? Uh, the challenge that we have is that uh, best we can also with additional hires when we are looking at people, we want them located actually physically in the office. Some of this is still legacy effects of COVID when people got used to working out of the office and it, it does pose its set of challenges and we're aware of that. I understand that and I, I'll appreciate when they're all back. Um, the other thing it is when they're renewing licenses, are they having to go through um, proof of citizenship again? I thought we did that a few years ago. Is that I don't believe so, but I will circle back on that to okay, verify. Okay, thank you. Well, I, that I was not my had that question when they asked me that, and I thought, we've already done that. So thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Chairman Burns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate your, uh, your input and your report. I want to make a, a couple of acknowledgments and a question, if I may. Uh, first, thank you for your focus on cybersecurity. I noticed that your proposal has substantial enhancements in that area, and we look forward to working with you along those lines. Uh, as, as we look at elections, uh, we've had a couple of opportunities to have communications from your staff. Uh, recently, in November, uh, we had a committee meeting. Unfortunately, you weren't able to join us. But uh, we did discuss Garvis and the, the development of Garvis. And um, at that meeting, I asked that you provide the committee with a breakdown of the amounts that were spent on the development of Garvis. And we understand from your response that was redirected grant funds. Is that correct? Correct. From the, uh, it's actually the bond uh, funds that were redirected. Bond funds that were redirected. Can, can you provide for this committee the amount of funds that were used to implement the Garvis system? Yeah, we'll get back to you with a that number. Yeah, if you would please share that with us. And second, uh, follow up, Mr. Chairman, just one. As you implemented Garvis recently in the uh, uh, in the municipal elections on a, on a limited basis, uh, Garvis was utilized. Is that correct? Correct. How, how effectively would you evaluate that uh, utilization? Uh, primarily, uh, you know, overall, it went very well in most areas. Uh, there was a few localized issues. Uh, be, people just being, um, as they were updating the, the system, and we worked on that. We have a, a checklist of all the items that we're working on, and uh, Blake's been working on that. His team have been working. Uh, I know they've been working uh, Saturdays and Sundays, sometimes you know during that municipal election to work on and knock those down and to get fully prepared, obviously, for the 2024 cycle. And uh, one more, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. Um, the the uh, municipal election officials who were or those who implemented uh, that election on the newer software and the new Garvis system, uh, was their feedback positive, universally positive, or did, were there challenges? I would say by and large it was positive, um, but I think you're also referring to the uh, talking about the where we also piloted the upgrades uh, for the new. Uh, upgraded software system. That's separate from Jarvis. That's Jarvis true. Is, is so a, 517 upgrades were yeah, separate from exactly. Jarvis. Right. So uh, we've got good feedback uh, with the 5.17. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Beach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got two questions. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. Uh, my first question is, uh, when Halderman came out with the pro uh, report, the University of Michigan professor, about the nine vulnerabilities, you were quoted in the AJC on September 26 saying it would cost $32.5 million to fix those vulnerabilities. You say $10 million for 32 here. Is that going to address the nine vulnerabilities that were, were the 29 cybersecurity experts and yeah. aldermen? And We've been working uh, on the budget. Uh, just like when we, the original machines, we had a budget of $150 million through the bond issue, and we brought that in under. And we've been uh, whittling these numbers down, and we hope to even sharpen it even further afterwards. But we wanted to make, this is where we are today financially, 
And so uh, we wanted to make that request for that. But that's our goal, and that will take care of every vulnerability. And, and with when will that be able to take place, before the 2024 election? No, the, the implementation of that, because it's actually 97,000 man hours, and we've talked about that uh, in our Senate meetings with 97,000 man hours and 34,000 machines, 3,800 um, uh, devices throughout the, all the other uh, counties. Uh, that is something that will have to come post-2024 election because you cannot complete that in time uh, because of the extensive nature of this. If we appropriated extra money to give you extra manpower, could we get it done before the 2024 election? Not with 97,000 97, hours. In fact, we'll be building ballots you know, probably the first week in January for the presidential primary. The 2024 cycle, from our standpoint, uh, both political parties have told us who their presidential primary you know, candidates are. And we're working on, and we will be working on building ballots right after Christmas. Okay, my second question is, you, you just said we have set records in our elections recently. Why do you need $3 million to educate voters if we're setting record after record after record? Uh, and how came, are you going to spend that $3 million? Uh, That came from requests from the members of the General Assembly uh, that what they wanted to really do is have more, uh, really check your vote. We did that back in 2020. Before you cast your ballot, you have the ballot marking device. It's just, you know, have you checked your ballot? And it's really that voter education. That's what we're talking about. And, and that, that came from the General Assembly. That'll be in the form of TV commercials? or Form of that and uh, social media, other things like that, so that we get the message out. Before you cast your ballot, verify your choices. Thank you. Chairman Avatarte. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. Um, just like Chairman Burns, I do appreciate it. I know we've talked about for probably a year, maybe longer, about cybersecurity, and I think um, it's really good to see the investments you're making. Um, really interested in uh, the CISO position that you're going to ask for. Um, is that going to only focus on election security, or is that going to be a focus of basically your entire agency? Like, is that going to deal with the licensure section and everything else in terms it is, of the Secretary is, of State's office? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, it is system-wide. It's for the entire agency. Okay. But obviously, uh, elections is probably, it's all critical. Anywhere you have people's confidential information, so professional licensing corporations, and obviously elections. And elections does, wh whether we like it or not, does take up a lot more focus this time so a lot of that work will be focused in on the election arena okay well i look forward to seeing how that plays out because i know just with the threats that we're seeing just from china and other parts of the country on state government right now that's a significant concern i think to members of the general assembly um really brief second question is can you articulate in your own words um why the need for 4.1 million dollars for q uh, qr code readers uh, that came from a request from the General Assembly members um, on the House side. And what it was is that they wanted to give voters, uh, some voters question, well, how do I know what that QR code reader is reading? And so we went out and we got a quote. And so if you had a QR code reader, then you'll be able to, the voters that are concerned, then you'll be able to actually do that in every precinct in the state of Georgia. I got a follow up to his QR reader question since you put that in the budget. That that's. That is the issue that I hear about back home. Are we looking at alternatives to using a QR reader, using other things than that? Is that being looked at? It is being looked at. The, the challenge that we have right now with a human readable text ballot, it would be a two-sided ballot. And what happened, in fact, what you would see, because a lot of times when you have constitutional amendments and the ballot gets very long, you have a two-page ballot. And so that's one of the challenges we are right now with the printers that we have, trying to get everything on one ballot. By having the QR reader, it allows us to consent, dense it down to one page. But you are yeah, looking at Yeah, we are looking at that, okay. and that would just be another you know, uh, update that we Chairman could Taylor. look at. I mean, Mr. Secretary, I, I would just challenge that slightly. I and encourage you to, and the department to look at this further. I understand the QR readers, and sometimes we get a little bit more information up here than they may have out there, so to Chairman Anna Patarte, it's for QR readers, but if we could just take the QR code off completely and read it as an OCR, I, I would, I've heard reports that right. this, the agency of the department has said that that would be more expensive. 
And I hear your comment on two cards, two sides, but in 1992, I sat at Sally Meadows and they ran my Scantron through and it was both ways. And it was reading my bubble dot, not my QR reports. That's, I think that's where we have an issue understanding. Right. Yeah, really it really gets get down us. to the ballot size and the printers that we have and the cost associated with that. But we can circle back and get you uh, the detailed information where we are with that status and what we could be looking at. I have two more budget related questions on the in that eleven million dollars it looks like a breakdown for six million of it is for the uninterrupted power supplies last year that quote that you gave us at the i say i'm I'm saying you as the head not yeah, you yeah. That gave it to us that's fine but the department gave us a four million dollar quote for the exact same item I'm wondering why the two million dollar increase for the same thing well uh I think we've been seeing some inflation. Hamburgers up, gas is up, housing is up, and so are those. Uh, and I think a lot of Americans are very dissatisfied with the inflation that we've been seeing, and we're dissatisfied with what we're seeing, you know, in this technology also. Not to be political, right. but that's bigger than me, and it's bigger than you. I think it's about what happens up in Washington D.C. Uh, and last time we tried to offer to pay half of that, and we're told by the department. They'd rather have none than half. Is that still the depart department's position this year? Uh, if someone said that, they spoke out of turn. I would always take half a loaf. The last question I have, and again, because I've got the numbers right here today, when we pull your labor distribution report, well, when I see this list, I think they're counting 24 new positions in elections. Mm -hmm. By your labor distribution report now, there are only 25 positions in elections. So this proposal advocates for doubling the Department of Corrections. I'm just making sure I Part read Not that corrections, correctly. elections. What's that? Did, did I'm not Department of Corrections, elections. If I yes. said corrections, I, your yeah. elections department. Is that? Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, this right here is the state of South Carolina that has half the population of us. They've got 69 people that work in their elections division right now today. And our competitor state, if we want to call them that, but similar population, North Carolina, has 70 people right now. We operate with under 25. And so we are really action-packed, getting a lot done, you know, and we then these are additional positions that we believe we need just because the world of elections has changed and we like to, you know, uh, have the office fully funded. We think now's very important that we have an office that's fully funded. That's where that came from, but uh, we still would have half of what these other states have. One of them is only half as big as us, the other one's similar size. And that's back in your detailed report, I believe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I got a quick follow-up on the QR code readers. Does this technology already exist? Are these machines already being made? Um, and the word is kind of buying off the shelf tech, or what's the status of the QR reader? The, for the ones that we want to use, yes, that's in the budget, uh, they are available. Okay. I had a question then about the $600,000 of software research and development. What's the research and development that's happening if these are already available? Well, to make sure that uh, the system actually will work with the Dominion QR code readers, it would actually be a, an outside other vendor. I'm just, so there's no way to quickly test and print out a QR code and see if the QR code readers that are already made will work with Dominion's, it's just you're printing a QR code, you know what the data is, the QR code exists, why can we not just check that and It was the quote that we have right now for a complete system, that's why we put it in like that. Okay. But we can get you uh, additional information. That'd be helpful. My last question is around the 97,000 hours. Um, I know we've had some private conversations about this, but then I've don't remember all of these details, so for my memory and the benefit of the committee, can you walk us through that process? How many people are involved in the updating the software in the 34,000 BMDs, yeah. the 3,800, I think was the number you said, um, and, and kind of what's involved in that? Okay. That'd be helpful yeah, for Yeah, Blake us. developed the 97,000 man hours. I'll let him just flesh that out. Good afternoon.
Should have known that was a senator. Ready to leave? But she was trained in the House, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Prior to me. So to, to walk through the hours, um, a portion of the upgrade will be done by a vendor team. Um, that's the amount for $5.2 uh, million. And the team that we would have come behind them to acceptance test the equipment to make sure that what was put on the machines was appropriate and is functioning properly. We have eight uh, that would be uh, time limited positions that would work 40 hours a week uh, for 26 weeks. Uh, and then 50 uh, that would work 40 hours a week for 26 weeks uh, as well that are acceptance testing specialists. And so that would be uh, teams of six to eight um, eight teams of six to eight people each that would be following the vendor team so that after that is installed, they're able to acceptance test the equipment. Do you know how many vendor teams there would be and, and how many people per team? I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We can get that for you. Yeah. Chairman Beach, is that you again? No. Okay. Um, anybody have any more questions? I'll close with, with this. Um, Mr. Secretary, you mentioned a couple of your responses that members of the assembly had requested some of these items. And part of my opening comments today were communication. And we're here. We're open. And any request or communication that you would like, please don't hesitate to come see us, okay? okay. Thank you, well, we and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Y'all ask me questions. I'm sorry, oh, okay. Next up is the illustrious Commissioner of Agriculture. I think there's a way to make this full size. Sir. There's a way to do it. I think that'll work. Do it. I will. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Com Commissioner Harper, um, I, I do kind of turn this over to you with a little hesitance because the last time you made a presentation, no, I'm not going to tell him to stand up. He's standing up. Mr. Chair. Last time, last time you made a presentation, <laughs> You start off with a screen that had like a full size picture of you. <laughs> now, I haven't seen your presentation. Are we gonna see a full size picture of you? Oh no, sir. You got good, all you good. got right here, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you. I think this is plenty. Do you have the stool over there? The problem oh. is some of these folks, if there were anybody on the front row, they wouldn't be able to see me over the screen. We, uh, can we get him a stool? I think Anybody we need to bring stool? my stool next time. All right, the floor is yours, Mr. Commissioner. <laughs> Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I was going to make sure that worked. It does work. Good deal. Well, it's, uh, it's good to be with you all. Good to be back. Um, and uh, appreciate the opportunity just to come and talk about what we've been doing at the Department of Agriculture and where we are uh, as an agency and what we've been doing uh, budgetarily and, and, and some of the needs we're looking at for this upcoming session. Uh, so thank you all for what you all are doing. Thank you for your friendship, many of you. 
Uh, I have uh, enjoyed our opportunities to work together and definitely look forward to, to those continued opportunities going forward. Um, so good to be here. Uh, I, just kind of an update. You know, I'm got a year under my belt almost, not quite, a month out from that. Uh, and we've been really busy uh, at the Department of Agriculture, uh, an agency that oversees, as all of you know, the number one industry in the state of Georgia. Uh, a very important agency that works every day to ensure that that number one industry can succeed, uh, which in turn allows our state to succeed. Our state can't be successful if agriculture is not successful, and agriculture can't be successful if the department that oversees it isn't successful. Uh, so I appreciate our partnerships in making that happen uh, every single day. Um, our agency uh, is, a, is about five, a little over 500 employees. Um, we, uh, we have about 20 different divisions. We issue over 70 different licenses every year. We've uh, done over 125,000 inspections. We've issued 70, over 78,000 licenses in the past 12 months. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of uh, kind of our, our breakdown really brief. Uh, as I say, as I travel the state, farms to fuel pumps, gas pumps to grocery stores, and everything in between. And we do things that most Georgians don't even have a clue that we do, like weigh power balls. Most folks don't even know that we do that. Uh, and, and those are things that our agency does that, uh, that's the reason I say the Department of Agriculture impacts every Georgian every day. So the work we do and our work together uh, as a team helps us execute that mission. Uh, so thank you for helping us, uh, helping us do that. Um, just kind of a, a breakdown of our, our current budget and where we are. Uh, obviously, uh, the center, uh, all funds, is what we were appropriated this fiscal year. Uh, that's uh, FY24 so far, what we have spent uh, and what we have remaining. Um, I know if you start adding those numbers up, it looks like more uh, we've, we've, uh, we're, we're maybe spending a little quicker, but I think it's important to point out that uh, those uh, pass-through entities, and I'll go ahead and go to the next slide, uh, those pass-through entities, we go ahead and front fund those through the department. So as soon as that appropriation comes to us, we send that money out. Uh, and I think it's important to point that out. So at the department, uh, we have three main uh, areas that are funded through the General Assembly. Uh, that's ad administration, consumer protection, and marketing. Um, past that, all the other funds that we get at the agency are to attached agencies, and we see none of that. All of that goes through our budget uh, and is passed on uh, to those entities. So the department's budget in and of itself, uh, it may say 59 million at the bottom. Our actual budget that we get from state dollars is about 48 million uh, to operate the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we get about a uh, little over 13 million in federal dollars uh, as well uh, to operate. So our total operational budget is around 60 million. Uh, and that's what we operate off of as an agency. All the other funds, as I said, is uh, pass-through funds that go to uh, those other entities such as the, the vet labs, the, the poultry lab, the Ag Exposition Authority in Perry, and then soil and water. Um, so I think just to kind of lay it out just so you know kind of what our, our budget is. Uh, some things we've been up to this year operationally and what we've been dealing with. Uh, this little thing called the yellow-legged hornet. Uh, I was actually out with the, 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 our plant protection team just yesterday in Savannah. Uh, I went out with them, uh, and there, we, we are de working there daily. We've been on the ground uh, since August 9th was the first detection. That's the first time that this hornet has been detected on American soil uh, ever. Uh, so what's the significance of this hornet, and why is it important, and why are we involved? Uh, well, the hornet is a ferocious predator of pollinators, specifically honeybees. They kill them. Uh, and if you kill honeybees, and if we don't have honeybees, we don't have pollinators to pollinate things like watermelons uh, and, other, and almost 100 other crops that ha require pollination to grow. Uh, so we so far have eradicated five nests, uh, and so far we've only found it in the Savannah area. Uh, that's the only location we've seen it, uh, but we have two teams deployed out there every single day working and tracking and trying to find this hornet. Uh, we're getting to a point to where they're becoming more dormant, uh, which is a concern of ours. Um, but to bring you up to speed, so far as an agency, this is one of those costs that we didn't foresee, right? Uh, so we've spent about a little over $154,000 in our response directly related uh, to the hornet. 
and so those are things that we're doing as an agency and we work every single day to ensure that these issues are addressed so those in the agricultural industry can be protected. Um, uh, really quick story, really quick, uh, one of the nests we found uh, was in an area where we couldn't get a bucket truck, we couldn't get a, uh, uh, we couldn't get any type of lift in there to get to it. Most of these nests are 80, 90 feet up in a pine tree. Most of these nests are about yay big around uh, and stand uh, about waist high. I know waist high on me is not that tall, uh, but a little more than a little more than waist high on me. Uh, uh, so they're fairly big nests, five to six, uh, five to six thousand hornets in a nest. An average nest that we see for a bald-faced hornet is five to six hundred. So this is a very significant issue. Uh, but 85 feet up a pine tree. Um, so we spent four days trying to figure out how we were going to get this nest down. Uh, so the best we come up with, and the way I like to tell it, is uh, it was kind of like a Tom Clancy novel. Uh, we decided to do a night operation under the cover of darkness when they were asleep. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, we waited till it was night, uh, and we found some brave soul that would climb this tree 85 feet with a spray gun uh, and a chainsaw, uh, and he did. He climbed up there, he sprayed the hornet's nest, killed them, cut the, cut the hornet's nest out of the tree with a chainsaw, no stings, no injuries, no anything. Uh, and so, um, I'm going to be honest, I don't have a clue what we paid the tree surgeon, uh, but you, I, you wouldn't have paid me enough to go up a tree with 5,000 hornets. I was going to ask you, yes, Commissioner, sir. is it true that that's part, that is actually 154,000 yeah, of right. those dollars? That's right, $154,592 of our expense was the tree surgeon. Uh, it's only cost us 20 cents as an agency to do the operational, or the other operational responses. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, it's been an interesting ordeal, but uh, our team has been working day and night to address this thing. Just some other responses well, we've had one, to respond to. One more to. question, yes, sir. if you don't mind, Commissioner. Is it also true that no one has seen former Representative LaRicchia since <laughs> the <laughs> operation? There may be some truth to that, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, there may be some truth to that. He's, uh, he's put in his time very well uh, protecting the good people of Georgia. Just to kind of give you an idea of some other things we, we have been dealing with, uh, obviously truck wrecks. Most people don't think about the Department of Ag responding to truck wrecks, but we have responded to seven of those because they involved agricultural commodities or livestock. Uh, we have a team dedicated that does that work, uh, and we respond to those events. Obviously severe weather, uh, our tornadoes, the hurricane that come through our state, we responded to all of those events, uh, both from an agricultural perspective and a life's perspective, ensuring that our folks in the ag industry got back on, on their feet and running, uh, and a lot of trees down, a lot of crops damaged during that time. Uh, we had the peach freeze. Many of you are familiar with that with our good friend, uh, Chairman Robert Dickey, who's impacted by that. Uh, and then uh, we, we actually just had a HPAI event uh, over Thanksgiving in Sumter County. Uh, this is the first uh, detection this year of, of high path avian influenza in our state. Um, and it was in a commercial duck operation. Matter of fact, mallard ducks, uh, about 35,000 of them. Uh, we were able to, to go in, address that issue, uh, contain that issue, and, uh, and we so far are in the clear uh, in, that, in, the, in the monitoring zone. And so that's what our operational teams have been up to. So those dollars that you help us with from the, uh, our ag response team that you helped us with last session, uh, that, that's where some of that money helps us help, is spent. That's where those dollars are spent, what I'm talking about right here. Uh, that's how we can uh, do those operational, um, uh, those operational responses as an agency. Another thing we talked about last session was raw milk. Uh, and so far, we have, this fiscal year, we have spent a little over $236,000 in the raw milk program. Uh, and uh, we are, we expect this year to, to expend about 350000 in this fiscal year, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, yeah, those numbers are a little different than the numbers we talked about uh, last session. Uh, the numbers I was going off of were the numbers that I worked with our team on to try to get to where we needed to be. Uh, I told you last session that I would do 
our very best to hone those numbers down as I had more time to dig into the issue and understand it better, and that's what we've done. Uh, so we have a better understanding of where we need to be uh, going forward as an agency to have harder numbers on that, and I'll talk about that uh, in just a minute when we kind of get to those uh, those issues. Kind of bring you up to date on the on the farmers markets as well. This kind of gives you some an overview of uh, net income of the farmers markets over the last couple of years, uh, and uh, and obviously that kind of gives you uh, they bring in a little over four million a, a year in net income to the state. That minuses out the operational expenses that it costs to operate those markets. Um, and so uh, uh, this is what we're projecting so far this year. It will bring in a total revenue of about $7.5 million. Um, we expect it to cost us about 3.3 or so to operate those farmers markets. Uh, and so the state of Georgia will be netting about $4.2 million. Now, of the 3.3 that it cost us to operate, we get about $2.9 million. Uh, in the budget every year to operate the farmers markets uh, just to kind of put that in perspective just so you know uh, so we we receive a couple hundred thousand dollars less than operational costs what it actually cost us to operate now operational expenses are minor repairs those are not major repairs and we'll talk about some of that in just a minute when it comes to, to next year's budget I think we need to have a bigger conversation around that uh, but operational expenses are salaries and staff and and uh, and that type of thing and minor repairs at the markets um, and what we've been doing there. I will say, as some of you know, we have the, uh, the uh, Agriculture Trust Fund uh, that we, we operate at the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we have been utilizing funds out of the Agriculture Trust Fund uh, specifically for those, some of those more major projects at the farmer's market, specifically tailored to the ones that we, we would consider more of a life-saving issue. Uh, and so uh, we've been tailoring those funds to that. We've actually uh, been doing a lot of work out there, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. Kind of getting into this next uh, budget cycle and kind of what we're looking to do. Over the last couple of months, uh, we've been looking internally at our budget and where we are as an agency and where things would line up a little better uh, in our budget. And so uh, we've, uh, we, we will be asking for uh, some internal reorganization and some organizational structural uh, changes, hopefully in our budget this next, uh, this next session. Um, and, uh, and those are on the screen. Um, one instance, one, one example of that is many of you are familiar with the market bulletin. Uh, that is currently under the marketing program. Uh, at one time that made sense, uh, but our communications department, I've actually tasked them with the marketing bulletin and we, uh, we would like to move that to com completely be under our communications division at the department because we think that fits better there. Uh, because that's what that tool is for. Uh, licensing would be another example. That is an administrative function. That's not an operational function. Currently, it's in our consumer protection budget, which is our operational budget. Uh, we want to move that to the administration budget because that is an administrative function. Uh, and that's, that's basically what these are. It's aligning uh, operational uh, and, and budgetary uh, things that we are budgeted to and, and, and authorized to do in the, in the operations we do at the department every day to more align them with where they belong in our budget, uh, to more accurately reflect where, where they belong and what we do as an agency. As we continue digging into this, we may be bringing some other ideas to you, uh, but these are some of the ones that we have found so far and look forward to our continued conversations to ensure that our budget aligns uh, and the programs align appropriately within the budget line item uh, where they belong in our agency. Um, in regards to the budget enhancement that the governor allowed all state agencies to request and ask for, uh, I think the main thing here is what we have submitted and what we have requested uh, through o OPB through this budget enhancement is to give us the uh, operational uh, uh, latitude to address uh, some salary issues and some disparities that we have in our pay scale at the department. Uh, and giving us the, the latitude to be able to address some deficits in that particular arena and bring everybody up to some speed to where we need to be. Um, I'm going to dive off a little more into salaries in just a second, but that's what the operational uh, budget enhancements that we've asked for. Uh, that's, the, that's the request we're asking for and the need that we have uh, as an agency um, so we can ensure that uh, across the board, across all of our divisions, 
uh, we're able to continue to maintain continuity, but also uh, maintain uh, 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 staffing levels and, and salary levels uh, in, in places where they make sense. Uh, and in some cases, be able to give some enhancements to some salaries that deserve it uh, because of the position that they have. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to do so uh, because of the budgetary constraints that we've been under in some case, uh, come some cases as an agency. So kind of talking about salaries as a, as a whole picture, we've had this conversation uh, last session. Uh, currently, uh, to kind of put it in perspective, we're floating around 70 to 80 funded vacancies at the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we have about 45 or 50 of those posted uh, at all times uh, online. Uh, about 10 or 12 of those positions have been posted for a little over a year. Actually, some of them have been posted a year and a half. Um, and uh, in some, most cases, uh, the reason for that is we've just not been able to have qualified candidates. Uh, or in cases where we have had qualified candidates, they have turned down the position once they find out what the salary is. Uh, and that has happened more times than not. Um, so we are, we are having difficult issues as an agency in hiring people and maintaining staff. And so we're asking for some help to help us address our needs as an agency uh, to ensure that we're able to hire the highest quality staff to address the issues we need to address as an agency. Uh, and it's across the board. It's from our state vet position to attorneys to field inspectors. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, a field inspector for us, starting salary for them with a four-year college degree uh, is $39,500. That's what we start them out at. Uh, and that's tough. Uh, with a bachelor's degree come out of college, uh, it's been tough to hire for some of those entry-level positions uh, there and even entry-level positions in our professional offices like, the, like our veterinarian offices because we have a number of veterinarians that work for the department uh, across the state. Uh, we have seen some uh, significant turnover in certain areas and I get these reports. I get the HR reports every week. I see these. I see that we have people leaving us for other state agencies. They leave us for the federal government. Uh, so it's, it's been difficult to, uh, to compete, and we're gonna, we would hope to continue this conversation to help us address those needs we have. Um, other things that we're looking at and, and, and need to address in the department, our lab system is vast. Most people don't know how big our laboratory network is as an agency and the work we do, uh, but we do have some significant needs in our laboratory network. Uh, around the state. Um, we have grouped those out in different groups and obviously we can uh, provide that baseline information on what all of those are and, and broke down. Um, but uh, most of those uh, laboratory functions are upgrades for laboratory equipment. Uh, it's uh, security upgrades based on some security assessments we've had done in our labs uh, to ensure that we have the appropriate uh, fencing and security protocols and camera systems in place because just to be frank, a lab has a lot of things in it that a lot of people want to get their hands on. Uh, so we need to ensure that our laboratories are protected. Uh, and, uh, and also, um, in, in, in the role that we've played in the hemp uh, industry and, and the things that we're, we're discussing in relation to hemp, we need, our, we need the ability to be able to test some of that in-house. Uh, and so we're asking for some testing equipment so our inspectors, our team, can have the needed tools we need to ensure that we're able to, to, to uh, to uh, enforce the law uh, and enforce the capabilities we have as an agency to ensure that we're, we're being successful uh, every single day. Uh, I talked about the farmer's market a minute ago. We've done an assessment on our farmer's market this year. Uh, and following that assessment, I made a mention earlier that we've been spending some of our funds out of the trust fund. Uh, based on that assessment, that's where we've been spending those funds uh, on those main major issues. Um, but, uh, but we definitely have larger needs at the market uh, and I think this is a bigger conversation we need to have in our market system across the state and specifically the Atlanta farmers market. Uh, there are a lot of uh, major repairs that need to take place to ensure that our farmers market network and especially here in Atlanta, it's the produce hub of the southeast, uh, is successful uh, every single day and, and I think we can make that happen uh, with continued conversation and, and hopefully bond requests because that's what we're going to be asking for, uh, bond money to help us address those needs uh, at the state farmers market. Other needs we have uh, from a budgeting perspective, uh, vehicles are always needed. We have a number of inspectors that work for us that actually don't even utilize a state vehicle. They're using their personal vehicle. I'll be honest with you, I don't think that's, that's I don't think we need to do that. I think our inspectors need to be 
in a marked vehicle, a state vehicle, uh, to do their job. Uh, but we also have some uh, vehicles that need to be retired and replaced, so we're asking for that. Uh, all of you know about the EV program that has been passed, and we, are now, we will now be uh, authorized to oversee uh, starting this next January, uh, unless things, different things happen. Um, but uh, this is going to be, a, so far, a very expensive program. I'll give you an example. The testers we were looking at last session and basing our projections off of uh, were about $50,000. That same tester right now is $150,000. Uh, so just since session, uh, the cost of the tester has increased by three times. Uh, so those are things that I think we've got to have serious conversations about uh, in regards to that. We have uh, stood up the Feral Hog Task Force in partnership with the Department of Natural Resources, USDA, and the Association Conservation Districts across the state, specifically focused on ensuring that we can address crop depredation issues for our farmers related to feral hogs. This is a big concern. Uh, and so we're asking for $150,000 for the department uh, and the work that we're doing in our partnership. Uh, it's led by a task force commander from USDA that USDA is funding. Uh, but this money is going toward helping train, teach farmers and producers, and also help us purchase equipment uh, to help our producers address this issue. It's a very serious issue in agriculture and something we need to work on. Uh, federal reimbursements is something we can talk about all the time. A lot of things that we do, we get reimbursed from the feds on, but sometimes we don't get a full reimbursement from the feds. And in some cases, we don't get our reimbursement at all. Uh, and it makes it operational difficult, operationally difficult at times for our agency uh, because we have to pull funds out of our operations budget to cover that. Uh, and, uh, and that's something I think is just an important point just to, just to note. The raw milk program, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to cost us about $350,000 in this first year. We estimate about $250,000 is the reoccurring cost as it stands right now based on the number of people who have applied for a license. Obviously, if that increases, uh, the cost to the department would increase, uh, and so we would be having those conversations if that was the case. But right now, we're looking at about that much money. Uh, and the last thing, uh, just to kind of hit on, is hemp. I mentioned that earlier with cannabis, or uh, with the, the testing equipment, sorry. Uh, and uh, I, I will tell you some of the things that some of my counterparts have been doing around the country related to hemp, I think are something that we as an agency, uh, we can do with the right resources and the right tools, uh, both statutorily and, uh, and, and financially. Um, I'll give you, for example, in the state of Florida, my, my counterpart down there in the Department of Agriculture uh, they led a, uh, an operation uh, where they hit about 500 stores uh, and seized over 70,000 illegal hemp products. Uh, we have that issue in the state of Georgia. The Department of Agriculture is ready to go to work to address that issue to ensure we have a hemp program that actually will work and we have legal products in our state and we're not a black market. Uh, and we can do that. We just have to have the right resources and the right statutory authority to help us make that happen. We're ready to go to work. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's a lot. I know I jumped a lot on you. There's a lot more that we can talk about. Uh, I know we have very limited time, uh, but, uh, but I, and, I, and I know I talked fast too. So, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity just to kind of give you an update on what we're doing, where we're at, and where we're planning to go. And I look forward to our work together to ensure the number one industry can continue to be successful. So thank you all. Thank you, Commissioner. First question is uh, Chairman Chokas. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, you mentioned earlier about the, the, the Avion uh, duck problem yes, that we have in Sumter County, and I know the people that own the ducks, and it, well, you're right, with 35,000 of those animals were destroyed. What type of compensation, if any, will the state do uh, uh, for that, and is there federal money as well to help compensate these guys because they are small business owners yes sir and uh, uh, and good people yes sir i I was actually out there uh, mr. Chairman, I went out there myself the day after Thanksgiving to be with our team and also to meet with the owners and have a conversation with them um, you know whenever you're you're out there in an operation like that that people have poured their life and their blood and sweat and tears into it, it is it is very difficult. Um, and, uh, and, and we just had some honest conversation. Uh, I assured them that we would be here every step of the way, not just when we pack up and leave, but we're going to help them through this. Um, on an operation this size and, and a financial uh, liability this size, 
USDA actually steps in. So they are working currently with our friends uh, at USDA to help them get, uh, get them compensated. I know they're currently going through the back and forth on what actually is and isn't a covered cost, um, but we're here to help them in those conversations and I'm committed to doing that to ensure that as much as they can be made whole that they are so they can get back in operation as quickly as possible. Thank you, thank you for that personal attention. Uh, these are good people. Yes, sir. Young people, and uh, they are. As I say, uh, we just to your point though, we do have a small indemnity fund that we do operate at the department, but on an operation this size, it yeah. would never cover it. Yeah. Uh, yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whip Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, it's great to see you today. Good to see and, you. And yes, I sir. Always, I always hate being the bad guy, but <laughs> I guess I am. My question was dealing with the avarian flu there also. Uh, I, I certainly hope there's an after action report that's gonna come out that makes us all aware of this that will tell us where the avarian flu came from because I have concerns with us compensating anybody for anything if this, if this was brought in from outside the state of Georgia in a mass purchase of fowl because avarian flu, as, as much as we like to talk about um, COVID and other things is an extremely serious health risk should it get out into our community. When we're talking yep. about that many birds yes, uh, having to be destroyed to protect our community, our livestock, our agriculture, and, and our, our families, then, I mean, that's a, that's a huge risk. It is. And um, we, we have national plans to deal with the avarian flu because we do understand the danger of it. So I'm looking forward to seeing that as soon as something's out there. And on the testing equipment that you that you mentioned, uh, and you, you know as well as I do that recreational marijuana is illegal in the state of Georgia. Yes, sir. So my my concern in, in reading the slide there, will you be working with law enforcement throughout the state, and will this equipment be able to be used uh, when we find that that individuals, because in years past, the GBI has not been able to test recreational marijuana because of the manpower issues related to it and the cost of the equipment. So if we're buying this equipment that will test for recreational marijuana, are we gonna be able to, is it, is, is, are our state agencies that enforce drug laws in Georgia gonna have access to this equipment? So to your point, the equipment that we would be asking for for hemp is actually the same exact equipment you use for all cannabis products. So it's the same equipment. But yes, uh, my plan would be to partner with any state local law enforcement entity uh, to help them in their efforts and related to that particular issue. Obviously, our, our team members and what we would be working on as an agency would be uh, priority, but uh, we would definitely be partnering uh, with those agencies and those entities, local and state law enforcement, to ensure that we can help them in their operational capacity to be able to provide the needed testing that they need as well. I know, as you know, uh, this is probably one of the biggest uh, backlogs of, of testing uh, that we have. I know there's a lot of other backlogs in testing, especially that the GBI has, um, but we would be willing to be a partner in that. Yes, sir. Yeah, because I, th I think you understand it. I understand your role in the hemp side. Yes, that's correct. respect that entirely. That's right. But you and I understand that hemp and recreational marijuana are two different products. There's a line that gets crossed quite often that we are, we are finding, uh, Senator Robertson, uh, quite often and, and, and it's something you and I can have a longer conversation about and something that our friends in other states have found. And what we have found here, which is why with the, with the right operational authority statutorily and financially, we can address this issue and help our friends on the local and state level, but also help them in those cases uh, as well whenever they have some questions that arise related to that particular product. Uh, I will say this related to the AI incident, just so you know really quick, from what, everything we know about from this case in Sumter County, it was, a, it was wildlife, uh, so it was not an importation of any type of, of stock of any sort. Um, so it was actually a, a wildlife, uh, we believe that it was wildlife that disseminated it to this flock. Um, and so, uh, but we are, we do have some things as an agency we're gonna work on to ensure that our response is as a top tier as it can be moving forward. Uh, and look forward to having your conversation conversations with you about that because I know your background in emergency management and local operations I think is important uh, and we're going to ensure that our operational response in that case is as, as best as it can be as we go forward. Chair Anna Vitarte. Hey Mr. Chairman, 
Commissioner, it was great to see you and thank you for, um, I think, kind of evolving into your role and becoming one of the, you know, leading ag commissioners in the nation. So I just want to thank you, Tyler, for that. Um, just as we're talking about, I know you mentioned labs and gap funding and I think, you know, talk about food supply and kind of what we've seen in terms of the um, global atmosphere the last four to six months. And I think when we think about threats, personal data, energy, food supply, um, what are your thoughts in terms of the budget, in terms of the General Assembly? Are there things even beyond maybe you've thought about that you would want to put on these slides that maybe you haven't? Um, and maybe this is an offline discussion, but I think to enhance your ability to protect the food supply in, in case of state or national crisis, cyber attacks, those types of things, because I know you're kind of on the front lines of all that. Just do you have any comments or thoughts on that? Thank uh, you. To, to your point, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, I think that's uh, you are heading down the exact reason why the Commissioner of Agriculture has a seat on the Homeland Security Board for the state of Georgia. The role that agriculture plays in our nation's national security, uh, the food safety and security of the supply chain is vital. It's important. It's important that we protect it every single day. Uh, there are definitely things that we can have conversation about, uh, probably more so offline, uh, to talk about from an operational perspective. There's some software upgrades that we could utilize in our emergency management uh, arena to help us. Uh, some of those SART funds we talked about earlier, you know, when we talk about emergency response, we really don't have an, we don't have an emergency response budget at the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and so having something that we could look at from that perspective to give us the, the, the tools when those things happen, we can deploy immediately. Um, and, uh, and so strengthening our capacity from a, from a security perspective, uh, uh, from, from an emergency response perspective is vital, it's important. Uh, and it's something I'm committed to because of the role that agriculture plays in our security as a state, as a nation. Uh, but there's definitely some things we can talk about offline uh, that I can bring you up to speed on, on some things we're doing internally uh, that I think would be, would be vital and also that we can add to to help us ensure that we're protecting uh, agriculture moving forward. Uh, we've been doing a lot of that at the Atlanta Farmers Market, I'll just be honest with you. Uh, our, our guys have been out there working day in and day out. We've, we've been able to address some crime issues out there uh, that we've seen where they have utilized agriculture as a means to an end. They've used agriculture as their method of, to, uh, to address their criminal activity. Uh, and so we're, we're going after that type of activity. Uh, it, it is definitely damaging to the food supply. When you find fentanyl and peppers, that's a problem. Uh, and so, you know, we don't know if you don't wash those peppers, you can get sick. Uh, so those are, those are the things that we've got to ensure that we're, we're fighting against and protecting the food supply against. And there's definitely some things we can have conversation about and we can talk about offline on some operational responses we've already been doing. I'm going to try to wrap it up. So I'm going to go to Meeks, but I'm going to give you a question. If you don't mind just getting it to us to, before January, when we do pay raises, you know a lot of folks in your agency are half funded, federal, half state. I need an update on where you're, what you're able to do concerning the matching funds from federal funds. Okay. Matching funds for federal and then, funds. And uh, then Representative Meeks, if you don't mind. Uh, last question. Well, I got a series of questions, Mr. Chairman, but I'll keep it short to two if that's okay. Um, Commissioner, thank you for what you do in protecting Georgia's food supply and, and what you do for all of Georgians all across the all across the uh, jurisdiction that your agency has. In, within your reorganization plan, are you looking at what we can do in terms of that emergency response ability? Yes. Uh, for instance, with the uh, yeah, with the hornets. You know, obviously, you've got to respond and respond quickly mm -hmm. uh, to an invasive species, and what would it take to stand that up uh, to be effective? Number one, number two, with that with that issue, are we looking at where this hornet came from, uh, and is USDA involved in that? So, uh, to to your response, yes, that's part of the uh, that's part of um, what I've been doing internally. Uh, is is I've tasked our uh, new emergency operations director, uh, who I brought on, who has years of experience in that particular arena, uh, to help us uh, help us put together some emergency response plans as an agency, so we can be uh, as prepared and quickly respond. I'll also tell you we are planning some training exercises and simulations. We can't simulate and train for every possible activity, right? But we can at least be prepared as prepared as possible. 
uh, from from a uh, uh, from an emergency management perspective, from an enforcement perspective. Uh, so we are working on that, and that is part of our reorganization and re. Uh, in, in our deep dive into what we've been doing over the last few months. In relation to the Hornet, uh, we know that the Hornet is, uh, is um, native to, to Asia uh, and that part of the world. Uh, so um, where USDA has been in partnership with us. I'll just be honest with you. We can't be 100% certain where this Hornet come from. However, considering that we, it is in the city of Savannah, there is a large possibility that it did come over from that part of the world uh, uh, in some capacity. Uh, how, we're not, we don't know, but uh, more than likely that's how it got here. Well, thank you, Commissioner. And, and I'll just end with this, and we've had this conversation earlier today, excuse me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, regarding uh, feral hogs and the damage that also deer is doing to crops across our state. Yep. Um, you know, we, we, had, we talked earlier today about that, and I appreciate your interest in really trying to figure out uh, how we can address that uh, in an effective way because uh, uh, wildlife damage to crops is becoming increasingly uh, more extensive as, as the years go on and pressure from, from deer moving out. And, and where, we, where we have these large developments, deer is moving out, pressure is becoming greater uh, for food sources. So, so thank you for what, uh, what you're doing in that perspective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think you've exhausted everybody. <laughs> well, thank Mr. you, Chairman, Commissioner Harper. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. you. Look forward to working with y'all. Thank y'all very much. Y'all have a good day. Next up is our state school board superintendent, Richard Woods. I want to thank all the members for hanging in with us. This is a, a long, long afternoon. And thanks. We're getting it done today, though. We got one more after the superintendent so if you want to be brief go ahead because that presenter is here too education's going fine we appreciate it and y'all have a great day if Thank we can you. make any, it as brief any as questions? that I, i'm done y'all don't so, need 13.1 <laughs> billion dollars again this year <laughs> school is out well, again, uh, thank you, again, Mr. Chairman, again, for all of you who are with us today, both the House and the Senate. Merry Christmas to everyone. Um, you know, looking at uh, today, we'll just give you kind of a brief run over of what has been asked of us. Uh, you know, we'll start off with just a few priorities that are coming from myself and, and my office, uh, just to make you aware of a few things that are out there. Uh, let's see, okay. First of all, we got uh, looking at, and I know that several have uh, asked us within the, the legislative body about transportation and funding. Uh, that is something we would like to, to you know, hopefully see our local districts, uh, especially looking at rural districts, uh, you know, shoulder a large portion of this. And of course, we're looking at fuel increases or in, you know, inconsistencies there. But I do want to say thank you again to the General Assembly for uh, the providing the one, $188 million, uh, in school bus bonds for fiscal year 22. So again, greatly appreciated there. Um, looking at school safety. School safety is not going away. That is something I think that we have to just have a realization of. Uh, you know, we are asking uh, for dedicated funding uh, for a line item on that, uh, you know, to help our systems. And again, looking at a variety of ways in which our local districts need to, to, to contend continue to address but over the years you have been very gracious in helping fund uh, these initiatives with the governor's office and again I want to thank you for that uh, as we look at uh, new construction what does that look like uh, but also looking at older construction which tends to be a little bit more problematic um, in you know in, in trying to harden those services but uh, you know trying to make sure that we also are proactive on the front end and hopefully by being proactive, this does reduce some of the cost and some of the things we look at. But uh, I want to assure you that, uh, that our agency, uh, GEMA, and Homeland Security are working together, consistency to look at this. And of course, when we talk about school safety, it is much larger than just uh, an active, you know, hostile individual, you know, coming onto our campus. Uh, workforce development, uh, as again, as the number one state to do business, we know this is important. We know it is important uh, to our chambers of commerce, our local economies, but we are looking to expend, extend our work-based learning uh, opportunities in the summer months to provide our kids with, with internships 
uh, to give them practical and real life uh, application to, to the things they are studying. And again, helping, uh, also hoping to, to uh, allow our businesses to, to perhaps even er train early uh, what we are looking at doing as far as workforce needs. But uh, again, something we're very excited about. Uh, growing the teacher pipeline. Uh, you know, as I shared, you know, this is something that is not unique to Georgia, but looking at ways in which we can recruit the best and brightest, but also retain those that we have. And I think, you know, trying to think of what does a, a teacher look like? What does that accreditation look like? Uh, and one of the things we're looking at is trying to expand uh, uh, teachers with the reading endorsement and dyslexia. Again, as we know, and again, what is a priority to you is the, the literacy, uh, you know, rate and, and achievement within the state. But, uh, you know, right now I think we can attest that we have three in, or three identified areas based on our RESA districts in which they can, uh, you know, extend this to uh, retired teachers. Uh, and I would encourage us to maybe expand that up to these two areas that we can include that on top of that three uh, to help, uh, you know, prepare and get uh, veteran teachers in there. Uh, sustaining, you know, screener delivery. Again, one of the things of literacy as we look at this, but also making sure as we look at and address literacy that we are also addressing numeracy as well. Those two things go hand to hand, uh, but we want to make sure that we have a sustainable uh, delivery to available to, to uh, our for our screeners and the support uh, of a tiered statewide coaching model. This will help, and again, I think having this consistency across the state is something we're looking forward to. Uh, and again, I know this is one of the things we look at as, as uh, you know, funding as well. And uh, one of the things providing SPLOS flexibility. Uh, as we talk about it, it you know, in the area of, of both, I would say, numeracy and especially literacy, thinking about what curriculum resources, you know, are needed. Uh, for a lot of our surface or school systems, again, we have moved away from textbooks. But now we've got to look at vendors, we've got to look at, you know, curriculum that it now is accessible to our local districts and again making sure they are high quality and really meet the needs. So again as we transition throughout the state uh, I think this would be an area again we're not open for you know asking for open season on uh, the SPLOS flexibility but being very targeted uh, to our instructional materials. Um, budget request I think Rusk I'm going to turn that over to you uh, and to kind of give you a chance to kind of hit that real quick. So our EFO or CFO uh, rest room will address some of the following slides. All right, thank you, uh, Chairman Tillery, Chairman Hatchett, General Assembly, for the opportunity. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the governor uh, for not only allowing us to request formula, but also some additional enhancements in this year's uh, budget submission. Um, first slide I got here is the FY24 amended. I know it's pretty early in the year. Um, and when I go through FTEs a little later, you'll understand why. When we submitted these uh, requests a couple months ago, we were, we were pretty far off. So I wanted to make sure I kind of gave you all a better estimate of what we're seeing for enrollment growth in QBE. So as you can see, for our FY24 amended budget, we're asking for about $105 million in QBE midterm growth. This uh, is a combination of both hold harmless and some FTE shifts in some of the categories. Uh, state charter school supplement, we're asking for about $36 million, which we have eight new state charters, and this also funds growth. Uh, special needs scholarship, we're asking for about $9 million. Based on our first two payments for FY 2024, we're projecting about $45 million in payments, and our base budget has about $36 million in it. For our FY 25 budget, uh, within QBE, we have uh, enrollment growth of $288 million. Uh, of that $288 million, that's made up of the uh, FTE categorical changes I'll talk to you about in a minute. And the uh, full salary increase from last year, it's a full 12 months this, in this budget cycle. So therefore, that uh, caused the increase of $288 million. And then a charter school supplement of $70 million for the eight new charters and growth. Of our enhancement and restoration requests, uh, the literacy coach coaching uh, the superintendent discussed earlier, which was $6,184,582. And then we are also asking for an additional $7,126,091 uh, for testing. Can I, can I interrupt you? Can you go yes, back? Sir. So the <coughs> literacy money, can you elaborate what, what exactly the $6.184 is for? 
his literacy coaching. I just do you have a you have a way you're going to disperse that a formula you're following. Let's see. We actually have a. Slide. No, you had it right. Oh, okay. It was on that. Yeah, slide. we're kind of getting to. Let's see where we did I miss the tier testing requirements. Uh, no, okay. Well, we you're going to show it later. That's fine. Yeah, uh, that's fine. Just keep okay. going. Then I'm sorry. Okay. Right. Let's see. Just keep going. Sorry. All right, next is uh, what I want to talk about, which is the single largest cost driving factor for QBE, which is probably the single largest expense for the state, uh, which is our FTEs, or full-time equivalent students. Uh, these are obtained every March and October through counts at our districts, uh, where they record what the students are attending, uh, part of six segment school day. Uh, these are grouped into 18 different QBE programs. Each program is weighted differently, which in turn means it costs, there's separate costs associated with them. When we do our FTE counts, we do an average count based on the last three counts, which this amended fiscal year 24-25 budget includes this October, last March, and the October of uh, 23. This is just another chart that kind of shows the collection process for FTEs. This slide right here is a good slide to kind of show where we were and where we are now uh, in FY 2021. You can see a 36,194 FTE decrease due to COVID. Uh, as you can see in 2022, uh, we saw an 11,887, about a third of the kids came back. In FY 2023, another third. And then in 2024, as you can see, 785 FTEs. So relatively flat uh, last count. This next slide kind of shows you where we at are by category, and as, as I showed you, we had some FTE growth in some of the categories. If you were to look across some of the kindergarten, middle school, and high school, you actually see a decline. However, we did see an uh, increase in some of our special ed categories, gifted, and ESOL programs. Can you stop there for a second? Yes, sir. Making sure I'm correct on this. So all of the growth in FTEs was either in special ed or English as a second language? or gifted and remedial. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And ESOL. Yeah, ESOL. All right, next uh, I want to talk about our testing request. Um, as I said earlier, the testing request amount was seven million one hundred twenty-six. Dollar, uh, $126,091. Of that, about 6.3 were asking to be restored from previous uh, budget cuts, and an additional estimate for PSAT AP growth of about 801000 I kind of put some uh, numbers back to FY17, really it was a 17 amended budget. We had about 29.2 available funding. Through the years, you've seen uh, numerous assessment pilots, increases, decreases. But in FY20, we had an additional three and a half million put in for the AP uh, testing exam. Uh, but as you can see in FY24, our base state budget is now back down to 22.2 million, which is about 10 and a half million lower than it was in 17. This chart I wanted to show because it basically shows the four of the state appropriation, it funds four tests in testing. Uh, PSAT, AP exams, G kids, and milestones. As you can see over to the right, I've kind of listed the budget and our estimated expenditures. Uh, the FY25 request for PSAT and AP is based on a 3% increase, which is the 279,851, and then the AP exam, which is 521,157, which is also based on a 3% increase in kids taking the test. Uh, for the milestones, you'll see a base of 13,486,697. In order to test milestones and complete our contract for this year, we need $19,811,780, which leaves us about 6.3 million short. In previous years, we've been short as well, but we've been funding it with ESSER, and as many of you know, ESSER funds are coming to an end this September, so that pot has dried up. The last slide I put in here is because we've been getting a lot, we get a lot of questions about um, if we didn't test or if we didn't test our standards, what would that cost us in federal dollars? And the short answer is we don't really know exactly what it would cost. We have billions of federal dollars that are associated with these assessments. 
However, we do know based on uh, the Maine Department of Education recent, uh, they were found to not be testing their standards and the US Ed has put them on high risk and is withholding federal assessment and Title II Part A funds. So we just wanted to make everyone aware. And that's it, thank you. And again, I'll come back and address the literacy coaching uh, real quick, if that's uh, a, a, a appropriate here. Again, as we look at the, uh, the amount that we looked, I think, at uh, funding our coaching model of $6 million, uh, what, that would, what that would inter would be, um, you know, full-time literacy coordinator at the Department of Education, also 32 regional coaches that uh, would be dispersed throughout the state uh, to handle and work with our local districts within each local uh, district. Uh, we'd have 181 plus, you know, plus the, the charter or state charters uh, where we would have a, a literacy leader or an individual or point of contact at the local level that would be in charge of working with us at the state and we would be supporting them uh, as they address literacy needs at, at, uh, within each school district. And, you know, thinking about uh, school level coaching, uh, stipends, you know, for individuals that, uh, you know, met that uh, qualification as, again, as they help to, uh, uh, you know, provide services to, to train their teachers within that, again, focusing on grades uh, K through three. Uh, hopefully, again, as we look at and trying to, you know, kind of share with us what would have an impact on our ability and needs as we think about coaching, uh, definitely making sure that our teacher workforce is coming to us uh, from higher ed. Uh, I think, you know, again, I appreciate chance the chancellor, again, as he looks to, to revamp that area. Uh, and our teacher prep programs. And uh, once again, as we begin to uptick in our training, then that potentially could have a, you know, an impact on what we are doing uh, within this. But for $6 million, we believe it is very sustainable. Uh, also, it is something that we believe that uh, we can uh, ramp up, you know, in a relatively short period of time and have uh, some good uh, impact on our local districts. Again, various districts, uh, you know, throughout the state, some have, have already adopted the science uh, of reading and have been engaged with that over the past couple of years. And so uh, the, the amount of readiness we're seeing across the state does vary. Thank you. I could ask a lot, but I won't. Senator Sims. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question number one, um, Commissioner, Superintendent, I'm sorry. We have, uh, or we are engaging the recess to do a lot of the training and preparation of the teachers for the new literacy um, programs that we're going to roll out. Yes, ma'am. So, in looking at the size of a lot of the recess and the number of personnel they already we already pay for, why are we why are we hiring additional people um, to work. Do we feel that it's, it's needed? Yes, ma'am. I think uh, as we look, Senator, when we look at trying to scale this up, uh, what is the most effective way in which we can reach the number of teachers that are out there to get the training? Again, we believe literacy is something that is very important. We're taking this very serious. And so in order to do that, we've got to hire individuals. But we are looking at, as I said, with the sustainability of, of, of teachers, that these are new. Again, until higher ed kind of catches up with that teacher training, that that's something that's got to be ongoing. Uh, this not only includes our teacher workforce, but also our paraprofessionals as well. So I think in working in conjunction with our RESAs and supporting them, but also having these individuals, you know, at a state level, again, we're not, we're not talking about uh, uh, a large number. So we're like 33 individuals at the state level, but most of the individuals are at the local level. Again, having a point of contact and having a literacy leader designated at the local level, we believe is something that we can, again, make sure we're all on the same page, working together. Uh, but they, you know, again, each district and each uh, state charter has someone that is dedicated to addressing liter literacy concerns. Thank you. That, um, having said all of the things that you've said, a lot of that is, you know, we're not dismissing that it should not, it's not taking place now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm concerned about the amount of money that we are investing in um, literacy, although it's needed. Mm -hmm. 
without really looking at the return on investment that we've had in education in past years. How are we going to, uh, where's the accountability here? Well, as we look at, at, at several things, one of the things we look at, of course, is the milestones. The milestones is our, our test that we look at each year. And again, looking at the information that has been addressed, we are, you know, have decided on a metric using Lexile, which again is nationally recognized as, as a leading, uh, I guess, evaluation for reading proficiency. Uh, throughout the nation, most of the states use that as as we will be adopting that. Um, you know, I think looking at the screener as well, the screener information should provide us uh, information, which again, the, our local districts will have to report back to us what information they are seeing as far as the readiness of their kids in grades K through three. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Superintendent, for being here with us today. Over the last couple of years, we've passed really a series of laws as it relates to parent involvement in education mm -hmm. um, and given the clear uh, really delineations of communication um, and, and ways that they can be involved in either curricula or um, library books, for example. Can you give us just an update on what's being done to ensure that uh, those policies are being implemented around the state? Well, again, once the, uh, as we look at the various laws that have been passed, and again, I do support, uh, you know, definitely looking at, at parent involvement. Uh, parents say so, local control. Um, as far as we have looked at, as far as the state level, we have not received any complaints that have reached the Board of Education or the state, whether it's, uh, you know, looking at content, whether it is looking at, uh, you know, performance of, you know, uh, you know issues, that, whether they deal with, uh, uh, you know, actions or, I guess, the, the expression of, of ideology that's out there. Uh, I do know that, uh, you know, from, you know, that probably locally up here in the metro area, I think Cobb County addressed uh, that issue, uh, you know, as, as, as one case, but again, nothing has been brought to us. Uh, other districts that, are, that I am familiar with, that once uh, issues have been brought, then local boards of education have, you know, have reached out and, and expressed that. There have been a couple of cases where, you know, I have expressed my thoughts to uh, certain districts. Uh, about actions that have been taking place. Um, and again, I've been on the record, you know, for that as well. Uh, but for us, again, at, at the, at the, at the uh, top of the, uh, at, at, you know, the state level, state board of education level, uh, based on the legislation that has been passed, nothing has reached us as far as, again, the process of going through the, through the, the local school, to the local school board, and then, you know, any appeals being brought up to us that we have not received anything as of yet. Chairman Hickman. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Superintendent, a couple of quick questions. Um, and I think Amy did a good job yesterday, the day before yesterday, talking about Senate Bill 211 and five, House Bill 538. But one of the things that keeps coming up from, uh, with our literacy council is the number of screeners. And we're very concerned. Uh, I know y'all turned those screeners over to Georgia College and State University and got them to rank them. And I think we go from very, very good to not so good and and i think what what we're concerned about is that that we will not be able to or the school system we won't be able to have a comparability among the systems if we don't narrow those screeners down to four or five screeners across the whole whole um state and the second thing is uh, along those same lines i know y'all are working very hard on coming out of coming out with a universal screener that will be free to all the school systems I'd like for you to address those two things. The other thing I'd like for you to address is uh, we know that House Bill 538 has certain target dates in it for certain things to happen. Do we have a budget yet on what it's going to cost the state to meet those target dates and, and, and how, how are we going to fund that? Ms. Ellie, do you have any information on that? As far as budget, again, as far as looking at the dates, uh, when you're looking at, uh, you know, say the cost of a screener or anything of that nature, again, we have no funding with that. So again, anything you're talking about in that area would have to be locally funded. So it would not be something that, uh, that the state, that again, I'm not aware of anything that we have as far as screeners, okay. uh, you know, currently. So that's something that, you know, if the general, you know, uh, to the general assembly, the governor, uh, you know, is, issues that, then I can give you more information there. So, so there's nothing in the budget nothing in y'all's budget to help the local school districts out comply with 538? 
Well, we, we have looked at, uh, I think, some of the ESSER funds, but I don't know that it cover, covers everything with screeners, except for, again, the universal screener that potentially, as we look at, could be provided for all, all districts. Uh, again, we have been working with our, our vendor of Milestones DRC, uh, and potentially I think that, you know, bears some fruit in which uh, that would be something that is, you know, would be allocated within the testing budget, in which that would be free to each and every district uh, throughout the state. One of the things that Amy said, uh, yesterday or whenever it was she said that she that that y'all were hoping that the school districts would comply with 538 and my statement back to her was ronald reagan said trust but verify mm -hmm. so how how are we going to make sure that these school districts are complying with 538 well everything we have now they've been provided the dates uh that has been very specific on that of, of what is expected to take place mm -hmm. um you know and as i shared with the board today we're going to comply with the law there is no exception with that so whether that is reporting out to you know us at the doe and again providing reports to the general assembly to our parents that is an expectation that we're going to continue to have uh, they we look at that you know some of the information or some of the uh, uh, legislation i think is probably one to two years out uh, but that being said we continue to monitor what that looks like uh, our expectations are very clear and so, uh, you know, I, I see no problem with comply. Now, again, might comply. That's not, you know, something that's in my language. Uh, we will comply. Yeah. And that's something that is a non-negotiable for us. And I think myself. a lot of our big concern is that, that our numbers have gone down so fast or not over a period of years. And we're all upset that we're behind. And we all want instant gratification on this mm -hmm. stuff, too. And that's what's got everybody stressed about it. And so that's why I wonder looking at the literacy coaches, if, if this is not, a, this to me doesn't sound like it's aggressive enough to really attack this thing on a real fast paced level to go forward. Well, I, you know, I think that, you know, again, what we can afford, and again, like I said, this is what we thought was a very, you know, uh, good budget, uh, you know, and it is a very, you know, like a tear, tear down approach. I think that, you know, as we looked at this, that we can get this out with 181 individuals working within their district, and again, looking at, at someone within their schools, then it's a model that, you know, we believe can be replicated uh, very easily. And we can, again, I think this has to be a very comprehensive, you know, plan. As I said, for our beginning teachers, we need that training at the college level. Right. I think that would help. And again, of course, you're looking at a four-year period of, of trying to pick that up. But for us, uh, you know, I think this is very doable. And within the budget, like I said, this is the, you know, what we have given uh, you know, as far as being reasonable, and I think uh, you know something that we can afford it as a state as well. Uh, yeah, th this is this is not the right statement for this room, because I know I'm in a room where the word is appropriations, and I'm an accountant, so I understand conservatism and all that. But I think that we cannot put a price on what education is for our children, and getting our state caught up to where it needs to be. When we have to look at Mississippi as a model to go forward we have not maybe i don't shouldn't say spent enough money there's something missing there and and i don't know how we do i don't know how we say this is not enough but this is not enough mm -hmm. and that's why i think that's why when i think of things like this i think of delving down to more into a budgetary side yeah. of it so yes yes well and again when i'm looking at this i'm presenting a figure now if if that's something that wants to be adjusted but this is what we believe that it's, I think is prudent. I think it is very doable. It is something that we can achieve uh, across the, you know, the state in a very effective you know, manner. And you know, again, if I did not believe that this oh, would yeah. not work within the state, then I would not offer it here today. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you coming. Sure. Mr. Secretary, I, I'm gonna skip the next question. I, I hope I'm kind with my words and pick them wisely. I'm, I'm somewhat troubled with the response and the question. I know Senator Hickman's a lot nicer than me. I, I share the concerns of Senator Sims. One, um, knowing these numbers, I would expect, I would hope there would be more people from the department beating down our doors with ideas. Um, th this, these numbers are scary for our future of our state concerning reading. And even if it means just picking up the Mississippi model and moving it over, um, I, I, 
I would hope that that we have more of a plan than that. Um, what I would ask you to do, if you don't mind, sure, is bring. I, I don't. I, bring us a plan even if it's adopting the Mississippi model wholeheartedly we've seen how that worked it show us what you would do what you would do and I'm, I'm concerned on another part too the 35 literacy I, I heard your, your department say I heard you say that that's not a whole lot of people it, it is a, a lot for us I mean we just spoke about an agency earlier adding 25 people in one department that's a lot we don't add that many positions normally in a year but those 35 people are most likely going to come out of a classroom, which I get concerned that we further create a classroom teacher problem. Um, which leads one to one of my questions: If wh what are you seeing? And you've been superintendent now for several terms. How we know in the earlier part of your term we talked about a teacher shortage. Are you seeing that number start? Are you seeing that shortage to continue? Is it getting better? Is it worse? Where do it, we stand today? Well, I, again, to be honest, it's going to be a challenge. And it's not something that's unique to Georgia. I mean, one of the things we face is that, you know, my generation, the baby boomers are retiring. And we are a large portion of the, to of the teaching population. So I think that is something we have to look at. Uh, looking at, uh, you know, looking at, uh, uh, retention, uh, you know, I feel that's where is more of an issue than the recruitment there. Uh, many of our local districts are growing their own, which is very, uh, uh, you know, uh, was very helpful. I think, it, you know, with the adoption of allowing our school teachers to come back at 100%, uh, again, and that's only limited to three areas, and that's per, per RESA district. So I think trying to expand that you know, definitely would help out. What does a teacher look like? And again, how, to look at, how are we looking at uh, uh, allowing our teachers to be qualified to teach again in, in many areas where there is like in CTA you know business and industry I mean they're they're involved with that so I think trying to expand that uh, we are seeing a lot of districts as well in which we are we are promoting our our pair pros and so a lot of them are going I back. guess is our vacancy number bigger today than it was last year and the year before or is it are you seeing that vacancy number as far as teachers shrink our teacher shortage uh, as far as this year, I think it was about the same as we look at that. Again, I would, I would just have to go back and get numbers for you. I mean, coming out of COVID, you know, we experienced a, a big drop. There were a lot of uh, retirees. But uh, again, we look at, you know, looking at leadership as well. Uh, this is not, I mean, last year alone in our superintendents, we, uh, we had 52 individuals that, you know, would change us in, in the superintendent ranks. So it's not something that's just li limited to our, our teachers as well. And, and I bring that up because your first few slides, I appreciate it. I, I think you've seen the legislature has joined to be your partner, whether it was people transportation, as you mentioned earlier, and as we've talked about addressing this next time, school safety, uh, teacher pay raises, literally almost a 20% increase in starting teacher pay. The average teacher salary in Georgia now is between 60 or 65 and 69, I think somewhere in that, that frame. If that's not addressing the shortage issue, I think we need to have a very uncomfortable but honest discussion about what is the issue in the classroom and address that um, because otherwise we're going to continue to hover around a 40 percent number for literacy another thing i'd ask if you guys don't mind doing is when we come back before january if you don't mind i would like to know we're not adding any minutes to the class day mm -hmm. so what do we think is no longer of i mean we're always going to say that education is of the utmost importance and we're going to tier those things accordingly but what in the classroom day should we be saying hey this isn't as important anymore and moving down the list so that we freed up those classroom minutes for what we're I mean the legislature's yelling literacy is the most important issue we're not going to what what else can fit between eight and three mm -hmm. um, so please if you don't mind I'd ask that the department lead on what we think that those things ought to be yeah, sure um, and last, as we get back to sort of what I think started my soliloquy, would be I heard what you said on, on your expectation of, of compliance. Tell us what you need to demand compliance because 30 to 40 percent literacy rates at graduation is not going to fly. It's not acceptable to anybody in this state. It's especially not acceptable when we're spending $13 billion on the on the issue as a whole. So 
Thank you, and I know there's other questions. Senator sure. Anavatarte. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try and be brief, and I do want to, um, Mr. Superintendent, thank you for being here today. Um, I do appreciate the comments from the Senator from Southwest Georgia and our Appropriations Chairman, um, because I do have concerns in terms of the investments we are making with literacy, but I would like to go further. Um, my concern is that I know in local school districts, you know, there's an abundance amount of resources, state, local share, whatever, that may be getting poured into curriculums, getting paid into contract services, things that never ever see, you know, what's going, you know, it never really hit or impact inside the classroom. And I know just, you know, living in a household with a teacher, uh, friends with teachers, uh, members of this body who have been former teachers, the dynamics in the classroom of, you know, minors or kids, um, you know, either bring in their own personal devices or school issue devices. And I know there's gaps with um, low income families, but that may not have access to this or laptops or iPads or whatever the case may be. But I think we're finding that um, in terms of the teacher quality of workspace, classroom impeding, especially in the middle and high school area, learning time, um, and basically, in, in a nutshell, forcing teachers to quit. You know, we're, we're, we're pouring money into teacher pay raises every single year, but this device um, and access to social media in our schools, um, I think is kind of working against us, even though we keep, keep putting more money at the problem and as we try and figure out and measure what is the impact. I would, I would like to hear from uh, the department, what are your thoughts on that? What can we be doing in a very bold way to lead and work with our educators and our superintendents and our staff um, to kind of, kind of crawl back the impact that this is having in the schools, which I know it's a national issue, but what are we doing from a Georgia perspective? Um, and then I have a couple other just um, other questions related to um, low wealth school districts. Well, I, I think that when you look at the impact of social media, the impact of, of you know personal devices. Uh, Again, I have no legislation, I have no authority to do that. So what I'm giving you is my personal thought and opinion. Um, you know, local districts, they make that call. A uh, local district can say there are no cell phones that are allowed. I think that, you know, we all know that there are, you know, are impacts that are out there and that's something that a local board can easily, you know, have that decision and they can make that, you know, this week if they wanted to make that. Um, you, know, you know, when we look at our devices, again, we make sure that, you know, that they are, you know, that what we are seeing is just something that benefits the child as far as their instruction and instruction time. Um, I think as we continue to think about uh, things of, you know, of, of more hands-on type initiatives across the state, uh, doing things with CTAE, which again takes this time out, uh, but uh, you know, how, how a school is actually using that, I would, you know, or a district is allowing that, uh, you know, I would have to, you know, ask them directly with that, but there is nothing that prevents any school right now from... So I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm yeah. asking, I mean, I, I know what my local school district would do or not do, but I guess the question I'm asking respectfully is, if you put a plan forward and you came to the Georgia Senate and you asked us to adopt XYZ to have an impact on culture in the classroom to make a teacher's life better mm -hmm. as it relates to this topic, do you know what that would be? Well, looking at the teacher burnout report. Because I, I get yeah, pushing it back sure. to the local school districts, but just being a leader, like what, what does that look like? Well, again, when you look at, at uh, you know, instructional time, I think that, you know, how do you use that instructional time? What is what it's being used for? Uh, one of the things that we look at that even now, uh, you know, is expanding opportunities for kids. I mean, to be honest, one of the things you look at is probably school discipline. Uh, I think what goes on uh, within a school, uh, definitely can can be very disruptive, uh, but that means you know how do how do we train our teachers? A, I think to, to look at classroom management. I think that is something that once again I look at teacher prep. We could do a better job with teacher prep with that. If it's something we need to look at at providing professional learning, then that is again something we can help provide uh, across the state. Uh, you know, having you know our teachers. You know, one of the things we look at is that we do take input from them. Uh, with our standards, I think that was something that we have been very aggressive with inviting them in to saying, what is it that you feel that it, our kids need to know? When do they need to know it? So both the, the, the math and our literacy standards are new. 
One of the things we look at that I inherited was something called Common Core. Now, that was something I was very vocal against, and I said we did not need. But it has taken eight years just to get the votes so that I could adopt new standards. And so I think that what we'll see as far as what we have or what we are putting in place, we have some very good standards. You know, we talk about literacy. Well, the previous Common Core standard did not have the science of reading in it. There was nothing in there that addressed that until we began and we adopted new standards this, you know, this year, this go around. So when we look at, at uh, what we're looking at doing, providing that, providing resources that were our teachers now, that we have, uh, uh, you know, tools in which they don't have to spend time unpacking standards, but we are providing them resources where they are ready-made lessons. So even for our new teachers, that takes place. Uh, currently, we have a pilot looking at our teacher evaluation system, you know, what we call TEKS. And that was one thing that I wanted to make sure that we do not treat all teachers as the same. A first year teacher looks different than a 10 or 20 year teacher. And so we are addressing those needs to provide them leadership opportunities, provide it something which they feel that what we are doing is meaningful. And so, you know, I think we're, you know, we're going to be effective with that. Also, we're doing that with, liter or with our, our leadership. I think leadership is extremely important. You know, what does it mean to be a leader? Uh, you know, to be, to be honest, um, you know, I think we need to invest more in leadership, you know, because I, you know, I firmly believe our, our, our most important individual is our school principal. They set the environment, they set everything that goes on, you know, it's in there. Um, you know, for teachers, once again, looking back at the report, you know, to be, be feel like they were treated as professionals. And, uh, and I think that goes back to the leadership training as well. I appreciate it. And just wrap up, um, we can talk about this offline. You don't need to answer this right now. But I would like to have a conversation about what are we doing? And I know this has been going on for years and maybe decades, but we're kind of hitting a, a macro point for school districts like in Paulding County and there's others that are low wealth. You know, we, you know, we're one of the few examples around Metro Atlanta. I know there's outer counties, rural counties that are, rural, that are um, low wealth, but seeing these rapid increases in population like Forsyth County, others, um, and there's a huge disparity in terms of gap or you know, funding for capital projects or whatever, and I would like to have a conversation. I know there's other senators that would also um, like to review and look at, you know, are there new policies in 2024 that could be created, adopted, adapted to the new environment that we're in right now? Because, you know, I think the amount of taxes that citizens are paying and what they're getting out of it will never catch up to where, I mean, I have a school in my district, in my community that has 3,300 kids in it. Mm -hmm. And that's ridiculous. So I think to kind of get to a place where we're, we get to the smaller classrooms, better budgeting, which that goes on the locals, but I think there has to be some sort of gap funding um, in terms of this fast grow, low wealth dynamic that's going on, but I think the policies that currently exist are out of date. Thank you, Mr. Uh, sure. Mr. Chairman, for the extra time. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Um, I think you can feel and hear the concern that many of us in this room and not in this room also that serve with the, the true love and, and um, just the concern we have about our education of our children and, and the want that we have to do what your teachers need and what our students need. We want to be the best. So let us know what we need to do. Um, and. I think we did, we've taken some actions that we needed to take, and I hope that they are uh, followed and we see some great results. So I think the doors are open and we're ready to listen and we do other things that we may need to do. So sure. thank you. Thank you for your time and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you, sir. Commissioner King, thanks for being patient. But we saved the best for last, right? Absolutely, sir. You know, I, I was going to try to catch up with the time, Mr. Chairman, but then I saw Senator Robertson coming in here, and I knew that our timeline was going to be blown. So, well, we won't uh, let him ask a question. Yeah. No worries. The floor is yours. Let me get out of your way here. I 
Thank you so much. Chairman Tillery and Chairman Hatchett, uh, thank you so much. Members of this committee, I know that I'm the last of the Mohicans here, so I, I, I give you big kudos for, for hanging in there. Uh, and I just appreciate the opportunity to come and pitch and thank this committee, because this committee has been integral to getting, to repairing the damage that, that this agency had. And you've helped us get the tools so we can get this agency back on track. And I'm very, I really appreciate all the assistance that you all have given us over the years. So um, this is our clear statement. I mean, it's make it short, sweet, but to the point of what our task is. And why is the reason why the insurance commissioner is elected in the state of Georgia is to accomplish this mission. And of course, I come from a mission type environment, and so clarity is incredibly important. Next slide, please. Sir, our, our, our agency is divided in several, in several sections, and I'll go through them very quickly. Our insurance division provides consumer services, and that's probably the core competency that our agency has. Financial oversight, products uh, review, agents licensing, enforcement of the uh, in fraud, fraud uh, investigations unit, and the premium tax collection. And I'll go into more details uh, very quickly because I know time is, is, is important. Our other division is our safety fire division, and this oversees all elements of fire safety and the inspection and sets the minimum fire safety standards. And so this is where you're gonna see our arson investigators who are spread across the state and where we do a lot of safety education in our school system. So we're very involved in the school system and I really appreciate uh, all the other agencies, including the Department of Education, allowing us to be part of that opportunity to touch every child in, 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 uh, in Georgia and bring safety education into the classroom. And the last portion of our agency, and is one of our key priorities here, is Georgia Access. This is our third and final division of uh, is Georgia Access. Georgia Access is an alternative to the federal marketplace, and it provides a better way for consumers to enroll and plan the best fits their families' needs. Implementing Georgia Access has given our state the power to improve the consumer shopping and enrollment experience in reducing the number of uninsured Georgians especially in underserved communities. And this is as a result of the 2019 Patients First Act that, that you all passed and the governor signed. Our latest statistics from CMS you'll see on the screen, these are not my numbers. These are the federal government's numbers. And this is how we can clearly show the investment where we outperform in the federal government when it comes to get, assisting Georgians in selecting health insurance. Next slide, please. We went into the weeds and found how are Georgians selecting insurance? Out of all the consumers who use our platform, we were able to see that 75% of those choose a plan outside of healthcare.com, the healthcare.gov. So they're not going to the, to the healthcare.gov to select their, their plan. They're going to agents, they're going to folks in, in the industry to help them and assist them. Because obviously this is, selecting healthcare is very complicated. I saw this as a police chief trying to get my police officers to, to pick a plan, and they always, well, pick the silver. Why? Because it was stuck in, you know, silver's in the middle, and you had to his own choices. And so this, this Georgia Access actually helps people get them into the plan that is right for them. 88% uh, of them, you know, receive direct assistance from an agent when choosing their plan, and 98% receive federal subsidy, keeping costs down for nearly every consumer. And this data comes from the, from the CMS, the Centers of Medicare Services in the federal government. These are our department goals. We bear in mind that several goals are as to be faithful stewards of Georgia consumers, to advocate for fairness on behalf of consumers, to ensure excellence as governor, uh, Georgia's top insurance regulatory body, to thoroughly investigate and prosecute criminal insurance activities, and to protect our communities from fire-related injuries and incidents through education and examination. We maintain the healthy and well-being of all Georgians through safety inspections and generate revenue for the state on every community across Georgia. First of all, our consumer services, who I consider to be our superstars of our agency. My job, obviously, is to be the advocate for the consumer. When a consumer believes they're not getting a fair shake from, from their insurance companies, they call our office, we investigate, and we take action. So far, since we've been in office, we've been able to recover over $67 million back into consumers' pockets from insurance companies. 
So we've been incredibly successful in resolving situations. Many of you all have sent complaints to our office that we've investigated, and I appreciate those continued referrals. That tells me that you have confidence in our agency to actually do the right thing for the consumer. And of course, my pitch to you, if you have continued to have, you know, your constituents have problems with insurance companies, please do not hesitate two seconds. You call us and we'll act on it. You know, our biggest challenge right now is, is in Georgia. Fraud is a major issue that, we, that we're facing across the nation. Georgia is extremely high uh, in, insur in insurance fraud. And our Criminal Investigations Division is responsible for investigating insurance fraud and all related crimes. Behind tax evasion, insurance fraud is the second most, most costly white-collar uh, white crime in America. And this is per, per the National Insurance Crime Bureau. The cost of insurance fraud are passed directly to every consumer, and it costs an average family in the United States between $400 and $700 of additional premium costs. When I began in 2019, our CID uh, unit had nine agents spread across Georgia. And now proud to report that with y'all's assistance and helping us prioritize, now we have 28 agents spread across Georgia with, local, with relationships with local sheriffs, local district attorneys, and so we're not having to commute from, from Atlanta, Georgia to go talk to a, to a victim of insurance fraud. And we, we are in the local communities and we've taken a lot of our relationship with local law enforcement, they've given me death, state, death pace in their stations, and that way you're not helping me have to pay rent to the Georgia Building Authority for, for a desk here in Atlanta. So I'm very grateful for, for that flexibility that you've given us. Arson investigations is, some, is an area that we've completely revamped. Um, I'm also the super, I supervise the state, uh, state fire marshal's office, which makes us the primary fire marshal responsible for most areas in the state. Our services are available to any agency that requests our assistance, no matter how big and how small. We can, resp we, we can respond to any request from across Georgia in less than 90 minutes. Usually as an investigator with a canine, which helps uh, release in, uh, fire crews when there's a suspicious fire. They don't have to maintain a fire crew there waiting for the, insurance, for the arson investigator to arrive. We're there very quickly and we release those, those crews so they don't have to maintain uh, any, uh, the, the scene. We're also responsible for various inspections, including sprinkler systems in every building, elevators, escalators, boilers, fireworks, and, and more. Racetracks is one of the things that we, we also inspect. While I'm proud of all these steps that we've taken over the years, I'm coming to you to ask for, uh, for an increase on our inspectors, as for our building inspectors. And I'll outline that, our, that request in, in the next slide or two. This is something that we're very proud of. My agency is the second largest generator of revenues for the state of Georgia, right behind the Department of Revenue. In 2022, we collected nearly $1.6 billion in premium tax revenue. 910 million of that was distributed to every city and to every county in Georgia, and the other 682 million being collected went to the state treasury. And so that's how our agency is contributing to, to, to the welfare of our state. And now let me talk about how, we, we're, uh, our, how our request is, is lined up for. For fiscal year 24 and 25, we have three main areas of request. First, I'm asking for for flexibility to shift funds uh, across the, our agency. First, we're asking for movement of funds to increase the capabilities of our safety fire division, our building inspectors. Second, I'm asking for funding for the reinsurance program, which has kept our health insurance premiums low, especially in our rural parts of our state. That's where the biggest impact has, has occurred. And lastly, I'm asking for one-time investment in our Georgia Access Program, so when in 2025, it will be fully funded by by the fees collected, but right now we're in a transition of pulling and setting this program up, and so I need one-time funds to be able to get us across the, the finish line. This is a strategic budget request. For fiscal year 24, we're asking for the following. A million dollar reallocation from other programs to safety fire division. This will be used to hire additional fire ins uh, safety inspectors for unattended buildings and procure necessary vehicles and, and staff we're also asking for $210 million investment into reinsurance, and this is to maintain our thriving health insurance market that keeps premiums low for consumers. 
Last year's data, we were able to show the 30% reduction in, in, in our rural part of our state on health insurance and 12% across the state of Georgia. So the reinsurance program is paying big dividends to our state. Is yes. that a reduction in the premium, premium or yes. over premium? Pre yes. Okay. And lastly, uh, uh, a one-time investment of $16.5 million uh, to uh, Georgia Access. And this is to drive, continue to drive the information down to local communities uh, to, to get the consumers on that platform and to reduce the number of uninsured Georgians. And the challenge here is when people are not covered with insurance, they're going to our emergency rooms to get in health care, which is the most expensive, most inefficient way of getting health care. And so we're making, we have some very impressive numbers that, that I will go uh, in other slides and show you how people are, are this has been a, a success but we can't just relax in the middle of, of our transition away from the ACA into a Georgia-based system. For fiscal year 25, we are requesting a, the reallocation of 1.3 million to the Safety Fire Division from other programs, which will fund these same positions that created in 24 for an entire year. An additional 3% increase equating to 558,000, which allow us to address longstanding gaps between building inspectors and long-standing and uh, operational capacity. As you can imagine, with the incredible growth that George has taken, I had to shift priorities to new construction. And this will allow me to rebalance our agency so we can take care of existing construction. So make sure that we're not neglecting those inspections. We need to, uh, we'll, uh, the continued support for the reinsurance program is key to, to the success of, of the Georgia Access and, of course, the 2019 Patients First Act that you all passed. We will not need any additional supplementation of Georgia Access because once this program is fully standard, any fees that collected will go back into the reinsurance program. So it will help stabilize. I just need that one year funds uh, to help us do the adjustment. Our federal partners, uh, the, the, uh, the president uh, was not as cooperative with us as in getting us to be able to stand that. And I'll, I'll, I'll pause there with the, with the political commentary. But. As Georgia continues to flourish, being named the number one state for business for a decade, our role in the Office of Insurance Commissioner and Safety Fire has never been more vital. With over a million new residents and a surge of infrastructure, including schools, hospitals, and businesses, and our commitment to ensure the safety and well-being of every Georgia is absolutely un, you know, unwavering. And that is, our, that is our challenge and that is our priority. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I will pause and, and, uh, and uh, answer any questions. I have my, my team here that will be able to, to provide any real technical, and we'll be happy to meet with any of you all individually to walk uh, any of these issues. We can sit down and talk individually about the reinsurance program. Obviously, that's a very technical piece of what we do. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. I have one question, or I guess it's really a request. Can you all get me a list of who all has received reinsurance money and by company, how much each is? We can do that, sir. Okay. Um, Chairman Hawkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we're showing a $210 million for the reinsurance program in 2024. We're talking about continued support. I know there's federal pass-through money with this program. we have any idea what the cost will be in 2025 to the state for the reinsurance? Sir, uh, um, that that amount changes based on the number right. of claims. So that's why right. it, it fluctuates. Uh, and so we're, we haven't gotten the, the, the bills for, for this year, but we'll be able to provide that as soon as, as, soon as we get that, okay. to be able to close that out. And second and last question, I know this was a five-year uh, plan, a five-year exemption on the 1332 waiver, and they held us up. So we're only in the second year. Are they going to give us additional years? I, th I think we're... Sir, we, we moved at such a speed that our, that our federal friends could not catch up. I wanted to do it in one year. That was my goal. I beat my team that we were not going to take any, any excuses. And we outperformed every state that we were, that we were working. And unfortunately, the federal, the federal government is, you know, they were like, well, you're, you're, you're moving too fast. Right. And it, it, ideally, what I'm trying to do is get Georgians in charge of the health care outcomes of Georgians yeah. and not send all that revenue that's generated up to Washington and then hope that they send 
Georgia their fair shake. This will help us generate these fees that will go back into, they have to be used in reinsurance. So this will stabilize in reinsurance. And so that's what this year, you got, you're getting sticker shock on that. And I, and I clearly understand that. Right, yeah, I know that's phase two. Mm -hmm. Appreciate all your hard work, because I know the ACA silver plan got up to almost $1,000 a month. Chairman Long, I, I think I see some blood on his staff back there from what <laughs> it builds did. resiliency, Mr. Chairman. No, I have, I have an Chair incredible team, sir. Chairman Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, thank you for being here today. Uh, one comment real quick. I do commend you and your team. Anytime that I have called your office to, uh, with a constituent issue with an insurance company, your team has responded in a very swift manner. I do appreciate that. Um, the other question, the, the question that I have is even with the backlog of building and even with the added building inspectors, and the funds to retain inspectors, what kind of backlog do you see remaining from year to year? Sir, we, we've cut down severely. When I first took over, we were seven months behind. And as you can imagine, with this inflation that's hitting us, time and materials is breaking the back of many economic developments, and that was unacceptable. So we shifted our, our talent and our processes and then had expediting fees so we can contract out to speed up. We, we pushed that. My worry now is we, we then decided to take risk on existing construction. Now it's time to balance. And that was, that was acceptable to me on a sh very short term. Now it's time to, to balance our agency so we don't neglect existing construction. I'm, I'm really, I don't, I'm not coming to you to try to build a kingdom. I'm trying to let data bring us, see what the demand signal is. Once we can, we can stabilize existing construction, I'll have a better you know, I'm going to have a better figure for you, especially in the next budget year, and be able to adjust that. But I want to be able to have the demand signal drive our, our, our requirements. And if there's contracts and contracting solutions when we can, that'll help us take care of the short term. I'm never going to be able to hire enough inspectors and hold on to them because the economy and, and, and I'm having to compete. So what I'm doing is now going to the Technical College of Georgia and bringing kids in, in, in with, their, with their help, training them in building inspectors and then putting them into the pipeline and, and they can go work for Otis or TKE or other in, uh, elevator companies. I'm willing to accept that because it puts Georgians to work. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, I see no more questions. Thank you very much. I, oh, I feel I'm, cheated. I, didn't, I feel I didn't cheated, Mr. He, he hadn't pressed his button. With Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, I want to tell you, you've done a great job. I'm absolutely shocked at how prepared you were. <laughs> and uh, I do give full credit to your team for making you look as good as you look Sir, today. Sir, they make me look good every day. I am, I am I'm the biggest cheerleader for this team. I, they're incredible. Well, we're Thank all you all impressed. for letting me have the All tools. of us that know you are shocked. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner, is it true that sometimes you get accused or, or people accidentally think you are a younger version of Senator Robertson? <laughs> I've never had facial hair, sir. You know, I, 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 my wife won't let me grow a beard, so I did. <laughs> thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you all so much. Members, thank you all for hanging in. I'll make sure that we get some sort of overtime pay. So, <laughs> have a good night. <laughs>